All righty, guys. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening whenever you uh, get to watch this. I hope you all are uh, going to be joining us live because we've got a very, very special guest this morning. Um, we're going to get a lot of history uh, of Force Recon, but also we're going to learn a good portion of something I'm not very familiar with, even with my uh, deep studies into the Force Recon community. Um, we're joined today by a Fifth Force Recon veteran. Um, he was with Fifth, Fifth Force in 1967 and Third Force in Vietnam in 1968. Um, we are joined this morning by uh, E-4 Corporal, uh, Mr. Lou Kern. And uh, I, I've been trying to set this up for a while. Uh, schedules have been wicky wacky and of course the computer went out. So we are, it, it, this is going to be a great show, guys. So I hope y'all are ready. And um, without further ado, I am going to go ahead and pass it over to Mr. Lou and let him give a brief biography uh, so we can get things kicked off. Hope you're doing good this morning, Mr. Lou. Uh, pleasure to be here and uh, hopefully represent uh, the uh, Marine Recon community. Um, a bio, um, I was raised on a farm in Iowa. Um, neither one of my parents got past the fifth grade. They were both, my dad definitely, uh, grew up in the wilderness, the Canadian wilderness. Uh, and it still is if you go up to, uh, Eagle river, Ontario, and, um, there are probably less people living there than there were in 1905 when my dad was born. Uh, my mom grew up in uh, central Missouri, Mary's County, uh, which was a very poor area. It would be like Appalachia. I don't know if you call that the wilderness or not. Um, and um, yeah, my dad was the only one in his family to come down and become a citizen in the United States. Uh, my mom's uh, dad, and this is important stuff, I think, because uh, there's, you know, the, the history, it's not just my history, it's history of our country. Um, her dad, I mean, they, they lived in a, you know, my dad lived in a, a log cabin. My mom lived in a, uh, dug into the side of the hill, prairie homes. Uh, uh, you'll see pictures of them. I have a picture actually of her home, you know, where the floor and the back wall and the side walls would be dirt. And uh, that was because there was just no money there. Uh, there. So they were depression era. They were not World War II era. They were older when I was born. That's uh, eventually what I'm getting up to say. Most of my peers, when I went in the military were, uh, their parents were younger and, um, um, yeah. So I was a farm boy. I, I was an athlete um, and uh, I was in science fairs. Uh, uh, I, I, I could have had a pretty decent academic career, but I, I didn't even know what study habits were. <laughs> and like many of us, more than a few of us, uh, we had a, I, I went to college right out of high school and had a less than stellar academic career. Uh, is a way to say that I made the football team, but um, I did not make the grades. I got a draft notice. And uh, out of that, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Uh, what, what year did you uh, d decide to enlist? Well, uh, the year <laughs> the year after I got my draft notice, or the year I got my draft notice, um, I enlisted in, uh, I think, January, late January of 66, uh, there was a two and a half month delay. I believe that's because the Marine Corps simply didn't have drill instructors or barracks ready to go or that sort of thing to take us right away. And uh, I had two and a half months of inactive duty. And I went to boot camp in San Diego, MCRD. I was west of the Mississippi in Iowa. Um, in uh, I think April 16th, uh, 1966. Um, I uh, got out of boot camp. Um, Ended up in casual company uh, at the end of boot camp and uh, uh, therefore missed the date for uh, radio uh, repair school, which is what where they were going to send me. It only started every six months. It was a six month school and I missed the date. And uh, they said, uh, well, I don't know. You want to be a radio operator? <laughs> and uh, I was like, sure. Uh, I just, you know, I really knew nothing about the military. Um, and I think that's more so growing out on a farm uh, where there weren't parades, you know, once or twice a year and that sort of thing. Um, uh, you know, and I didn't really, a couple of the, my, my peers, the kids I grew up with uh, 
parents had been in World War II, but I don't think I knew even knew that growing up. It just wasn't, you know, it was all about, you know, the farm and your cows and your pigs and the weather. Uh, that was the life. It was a very good life, by the way, uh, the agrarian lifestyle um, that I was fortunate enough to grow up in. Where did you end up uh, when, when you did join? Uh, wh where was boot? Where did you attend boot camp? MCRD San Diego. Oh wow, Hollywood Marine. Okay. Oh man, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's uh, that's where uh, Dad was as well. Uh, did w w you coming from uh, you know the being a farm boy? Uh, did w what was that like uh, leaving home and? Uh, you know, being thrown into the arms of uh, oh, the old uh, Father Marine Corps, so to speak. You know, um, a couple of things. You know, I was used to twelve-hour days and well, some in the middle of summer heat. You're a farm kid. You just you just work, and uh, so I was strong. I was in very good conditioning because of uh, my sports in high school. Um, and, you know, my dad was not a pleasant person and he yelled a lot. <laughs> and if, if I had a, if I had a nickel for every time he said, uh, you know, swear word, I'd be a rich man today. He just wasn't a happy guy. And um, so the drill instructors, you know, acting very unhappy all the time. Uh, really, it didn't, it didn't bother me. Boot camp was not hard for me at all. Uh, just keep my mouth shut. Keep, you know. Don't do anything to attract attention to myself. And physically, it was not a hardship for me. So, no, I couldn't wait to get away from home. And it was, I didn't feel, I know that's different for a lot of guys, you know. Uh, but for me, it was, I couldn't wait to to leave and go away. Wow. That's, uh, it's it's wild how much your uh, your story is, it, it lines up with my father. Uh, he wasn't per, per se a farm boy, but he was from Virginia and up there in the, in the Appalachians. And, uh, he, he had a, uh, a rough, uh, his father was career army. He had a rough go with him and he was all but anxious to, to get away from home as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not an uncommon story. And then I, I, I mean, not only, uh, I mean, it, I've heard it from the army guys, but it seems like the Marines too, the, the, uh, they, I, I meet more Marines like that. They were saying, you know, I was ready to get a, I wasn't doing good in school or wasn't liking school. And I, I wanted some adventure and, uh, no better place for an adventure than the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> yeah. I think there's something to it. I think, uh, if you don't get that sense of, um, uh self-esteem is what the, the psychologist would call it, uh, from your dad. Uh, if you, if you always have the feeling, whatever you do isn't good enough for your dad, then I think you're more prone to look at bigger challenges when you're 17 and 18. And, uh, to, you know, you, you have to have a certain degree of confidence, obviously, but, um, so I think there's something to that. Did, did you, uh, <clears throat> again being a farm boy i have to assume you you were hunting fishing do, you know doing all of that that farm boys do and and country boys do did you uh did you do well in boot camp uh what, what did you have any issues in boot camp i should say no i did not uh iowa very little fishing and hunting in iowa oh wow. yeah iowa is there was no wilderness in iowa um i mean literally just um the uh, deer were rare when I was a kid because uh, everybody had livestock. And um, uh, yes, the deer could jump over a five foot fence, but in the spring, their young ones couldn't and they mm -hmm. traveled with their young ones. And so the deer just kind of stayed away. It was rare to see deer. Uh, there was a little bit of quail hunting in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, my dad grew up hunting. I mean, where he grew up in Canada, there was like oh, a yeah. two and a half, three month growing season. So your meat mostly was what you went out and, and uh, uh, killed yourself. You know, and and uh, uh, of course, up there at that time, refrigeration didn't really exist, except you know, <laughs> the ice ice you and in the winter and salting your meat and all that sort of thing. So he grew up hunting, um, but Iowa, no, was not a hunting state. I had very little experience with a gun or hunting. Wow, that was my next question. Did you was I mean, had you shot a gun before the Marine Corps, or was that that your first time really handling a weapon, so to speak? No, we had, uh, my dad had been, uh, when he was a young man, he had been uh, Chicago uh, PD. 
Oh, and he was very proud of it. And he had the, you know, his blackjack and he had a picture of himself and like that. So he was very familiar with guns and he certainly told me about guns, but the only gun we had in the farm. And by the way, you had a gun on a farm, um, you know, um, a Truman Capote's in cold blood. I mean, occasionally you were totally vulnerable out there. There, you, you know, you were not going to call the, the police. You had to defend yourself. And um, we happened to live on a highway instead of a back road. And so it wasn't unusual for somebody to come knocking on your door, usually because their car broke down, you know, along the highway and, you know, usually at night. Uh, so, you know, my dad would be there with a the gun, you know, and it was a 22 single shot. <laughs> Can't do much damage, but it was a gun. It's so when uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think. So you're, uh, when you go in, are, do you ha already have an idea of what you're going to want to do or are, are you taking it as it comes? Uh, well, no. no, the recruiter had, had told me, um, uh, you know, promised me radio repair school, which I think they honored. Uh, I missed the deadline uh, because I ended up in casual company, but um, uh, no, I had no, I, you know, I'd watched, I suppose a fair number of world war two movies. Um, what I knew about the Marines is uh, somebody was always dying in somebody else's arms. You know, that's, I mean, I really knew nothing about warfare or gunfighting or even fist fighting. You know, we farm kids, fist fighting was rare. And, um, I think probably in any agrarian culture, you know, by the time you're, I mean, when you're eight, nine, 10 years old, there was a certain amount of jostling and pushing one another and establishing the pecking order in your group. But, you know, I was very few, there was very little turnover out there. That's what I'm trying to say. It wasn't like a city environment at all. There were no, you know, no gangs and no, we didn't even have clicks really. I mean, there were the athletes and the non-athletes. I guess that was a click, but it, it's different in the farm and these small rural farm towns. It's, it's very safe and uh, very stable. So with, with you getting in, uh, you're in San Diego, you're doing boot camp. Um, uh, with, with you going into, uh, well, eventually going into force recon, did you, uh, were you a good shot? Did you, uh, expert? What, uh, what did you qualify? Um, I did. I was, uh, uh I got promoted. Uh, I got made PSC in boot camp. Wow. Uh, I was not a net, a leader of men. I just wasn't, I was kind of shy and quiet and kind of tried to stay out of the way. Um, but I shot expert. Wow. And I shot left-handed. Ooh. And, uh, so I was quite proud of that actually. Uh, you should, and, uh, should be, um, and I, uh, uh, I tied the San Diego, uh, the, they don't, the, today they do the crucible, but they had a PT test, um, which was mostly like pull-ups, push-ups, hundred yard dash, 440 dash and squat thrust. That was the, the PT test at the end of boot camp. And I tied the record it, it, uh, that was posted. They had a big sign record 450 points out of 500. And I tied that. So I think between shooting expert and, um, uh, scoring that high on the PT test, they, they gave me PFC, but I was not a squad leader. Uh, that was never who I was. Wow. I mean, uh, that's uh dad got, uh, expert as well. And then, uh, pistol expert. And boy, when I, I see Marines and especially when I, you know, was seeing or heard and, and saw from his graduation photos of down at the range when y'all were being, uh, qualling and, uh, I, 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 it, that, that there's a, it, it's, there's a reason Marines are known as the best shooters in the world. I mean, it, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, y'all can knock a wing off a gnat at, you know, a hundred meters. It's ridiculous. Y'all, y'all are some shooters that's to say the least. Uh, did you, uh, after, after all of this is going on, is there, uh, what's next in the pipeline process? Are, 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 is an MOS started coming up or what, what's next? Well, um, I, uh, after boot camp, I went into casual company for two weeks and uh, they were, uh, the, the Marine Corps had a program uh, that, where you would um, uh, 
they would send you to Annapolis essentially. And uh, the way it worked was you had to had to qualify uh, for uh, a prep school in, in Bainbridge. And if you, I think this is from memory. Uh, I think if you finished in the top 60% of your prep school class, you went to Annapolis. And so at the end of boot camp, I, you know, I was moved in, uh, to the base sergeant major and uh, the Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence uh, in casual company at MCRD. And I went through myself and another Marine whose name I don't remember now. I didn't go to boot. He was in a different boot camp class than I was. Um, and uh, they put us through kind of two weeks of intermittent testing, a whole series of tests, uh, hand-eye coordination. I think they were testing. That was had to do with being a fighter pilot, I think. Um, you know, uh, stuff that seems kind of silly looking back, like doing push-ups and they'd say, what's the Pythagorean theorem? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, and of course, I'm sure they observed our demeanor, uh, you know, at all times, go pick up those cigarette butts or whatever it was. Yes, sir. <laughs> Go well, do it. <laughs> um, so that's that's why I didn't. Uh, they couldn't send me to the, or I would have had to wait five months for the radio repair school. <clears throat> and um, so I, uh, uh, the, uh, I remember Colonel Lawrence saying, "Well, we could send you to radio operator school right away." And I didn't really even know much about what that was, to be honest. And uh, so. I didn't want to wait around five months. I don't know if he was pulling my leg or not. He may well have been. He, you know, casual company is not fun. <laughs> it's you're bored out of your mind and, you know, you had stupid tasks to do and who in the hell wanted to spend five months in casual company. I think he was probably a little tongue in cheek saying, well, you can wait here for five months and, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I can radio operator. Yes, sir. I'll go be a radio operator. Yeah. I didn't know anything about radio operators in combat. Um, so how, with, with, with this going on, when, uh, when, when does recon start coming across the, 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 the pipeline or what, 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 what sparks your interest or where do you even hear about recon? Uh, I didn't, I had no idea what it was. I was in radio school. I was near, uh, the end, maybe two weeks from graduation from radio school, which was back at MCRD. So we went up after from boot camp, you went to Pendleton for ITR and the way the Marine Corps did it. Then you had a shorter ITR if you're going to a school. And if you're going Indi to be an 03, you had a longer ITR. Ind individual training regiment or? I think it's infantry training regiment. Yeah. Okay. So the guys who were 03s, infantry, mm -hmm. they would be trained in mortars and machine guns. And, and, and I think they, they even maybe had a specialty within that six week. That's a lot of weapons training, six weeks. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, um, mm -hmm. I went through the short version mm -hmm. and as it, the time I was there, Pendleton was on fire and I spent my two weeks in a, uh, back of a six by running around as a backup fire crew. And, uh, so I didn't, I didn't even go through the, you know, shoot a mortar and this is how you don't kill yourself with the machine gun and all that basic kind of stuff. And then we went down to, uh, um, uh, radio school. Uh, well, I say we, I, I did. And um, uh, toward the end, two weeks, my bunkmate and guy going liberty with Alan Snydecki, who's now, uh, or has been president of the FRA for, uh, um, geez, about 10 years now. And uh, um, there was a presentation, there was like a note in the wall, a little bulletin board thing. And it said presentation force recon. And it was in the evening. And Alan said, come on, let's go. Let's go. Well, what else are you going to do? Lay around your bunk, you know, read a book, something. So we went to this presentation. I think there was Alan and I and maybe 12 guys in the room. And uh, this gunny sergeant came in. I never saw him again. And I mean, he was starched, you know, the crease in the front of his utilities. You could have cut yourself on. And he had that. And he walked in and, you know, did a left face to you know face us and he gave a very brief presentation um with with an attitude of i really don't care what you guys do <laughs> that was how i read it you know it's and now looking back on it i get that was you know they don't want it's not romantic to go enforce recon you know if you have a romantic uh, uh 
too many romantic ideas about it, you probably will drop out. You probably won't even pass the PT test to get in. So Alan was just loved it. He just loved it. And Lou, let's, let's do this. Come on, Lou, let's do this. And he'd talk about it and talk about it. And at that time I was playing on the base football team. It was, you know, the fall of 66. They hadn't shut down the, the sports yet on the bases. I think the next year they shut them down. Um, and I literally had this thought, it can't be harder than football. That's, that's all I knew. That's, you know, how naive I was to the whole thing. <laughs> and so Alan and I went up to Pendleton, uh, to Las Pogas, um, to this company that was forming at that time. And as far as I knew, we were the first two people there below the rank of E6. So they, you know, they formed the cadre, the training cadre, and then they'd start to populate the, the company with uh, trainees, essentially. And um, we spent two weeks uh, stenciling Jeeps, inventorying boxes of supplies that would come in, you know, boots and stuff like that. And uh, we were, you know, working under Gunny Solomon, another one of those lovely, wonderful Marine, lovely isn't the right word, but he was just a great guy. And uh, something I, I certainly learned um, throughout my time in Force Recon, our staff and officers were usually stellar. And I really don't know what it was like in other, uh, in the grunts. I'm not saying it wasn't stellar in the grunts. That's what I'm trying to say. Or any other unit or in the army, you know, or in the Navy. For, but what I know of being in Force Recon for two years, our staff and officers were generally, generally stellar. And Gunny Solomon was from Guam and good natured guy. And, and, uh, uh, he called us in one day about two, we were in this barracks by ourselves. There was nobody there. Pogus at that time had no, um, there was no PX. There was no movie. There's nothing, you know, and it was like a tanker base or something. And, uh, uh, anyway, he called us in and he said, uh, you know, I got a bunch of young Marines coming in in the morning and, I want you guys to give them the PT test. And we'd never taken one. We got up there. Nobody gave us a PT test. I, you know, I don't know if we even knew they did such a thing. I, you know, that's how little I knew about it. And um, we were like, ah, PT test. And he said, well, you know, run them in the ground and let me know which ones wouldn't quit. And uh, I was the athlete and Al could imitate a drill instructor. So... <laughs> We adapted to our situation um, very quickly. And, and uh, he said, dismissed. And we turned to walk out the door. We were both Lance Corporals, E3s. And um, he said, just a minute. I can't have E3s running my PT test. You're hereby both promoted to E4. Oh. Meritoriously. So I'm on. So we were like, okay, let's get out the door before he changes his mind. You know, and but there was no place to buy the stripes. I mean, we didn't, you know, we went out with uh, Lance Corporal Stripes the, the next day and gave a PT test. And uh, I think maybe for the first month, uh, we gave pretty much all the PT tests. There'd be two or three a week, guys coming in, usually 10, 12 guys. And we'd just run them into the ground. And uh, whichever ones refused to quit, it wasn't how many pull-ups they could do or, you know, it was like, who wouldn't quit? And uh, it, that's not a hard thing to get the hang of, you know, it doesn't take years to figure that out. But, uh, so one day in the barracks at night, and again, nobody, there was no place to go. There was no EM club, nothing there at Pogus at that time. We looked around and there were like 20 guys there, 25 guys. And Snydecki and I realized every one of them was there because we said they were there. And I think that's the first time I started to feel like a recon Marine. Like, oh, you know, I'm part of this. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Ah. Oh, that's my history. <laughs> so with, um, and I'm starting to go through some pictures and everything. Um, so when, when is the exact year that you, you're officially uh, with, uh fifth force uh starting off uh when 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 does that take hold when are you officially in and 
uh, a recon man? Well, I was January of 67. Uh, I, I haven't looked at years in my DD-214. I'm sure the exact date's in there. Uh, but that was January 67. I got orders for NAM uh, mid-February of 68. So I was there, as it turned out, 53 weeks. And, um, um, you know, at various times ran the pre-jump school, as you know, the Marine Corps. They weren't going to send us to any school of another service unless uh, we had gone through a, a, a much harsher school already before we got there. That was kind of the way the Marine Corps did it. So there was a pre-jump school. There was a pre-scuba school. I don't think there was a pre amphib recon school, but that was kind of a joint Navy um, um, Marine school, uh, amphib recon, amphibious recon. Um, what, what, what can you, before we start getting into, uh, Vietnam a bit, um, I, especially, especially, and I know, uh, some of the other guys, uh, might not have a, uh, a, a big grasp on it. Um, considering we've only had first and third men here, could you explain a little bit of the, the history and what exactly fifth force, what their, uh, operations were at this point in time and what was going on? I, I absolutely can. So it goes, it goes back to World War II, and um, our job, as you know, primarily um, was to uh, hit the beach. Did I do something there? Or did No, that's me. I put you on single, so oh, people okay. pay attention um, to you. I, you know, and at the moment, I can't, you know, old man's memory, I can't tell you which, which island it was of the many islands that the Marines hit the beach at in the Pacific chain there. But what happened was... Uh, you know, they, the Higgins boat hit, hit a sandbar <clears throat> and they assumed that now we're at the, you know, shallow enough water for the men to get out of these Higgins boats and run, you know, charge the beach. And of course, the first part of charging the beach, you're still in the water. Well, what happened was it was like a 50 yard run, but there was a big dip in the sand uh, on the other side of the sandbar, the beach side or land side of the sandbar. And a bunch of guys drowned because they just, you have all this heavy equipment and it's, you're strapped, all strapped together and you just couldn't get it off fast enough. And we realized we didn't know anything about the beaches and all these different islands, you know, had different, you know, beaches. And um, so in, in a great deal of haste, a company was formed uh, called Amphibious Reconnaissance and they were the best swimmers. Who are the best swimmers? Who are the best swimmers? And uh, they were led by uh, uh, Captain Jones, uh, whose son, Jim Jones, uh, became uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps much later in the 2000s. Um, so the idea was that you would, these, these, so when the battleships approached an island, and we're going to take this island, the idea was that they would soften it up with artillery for four days, five days, they may be two or three miles out, and uh, uh, they would just pummel the island or the beach uh, headlands with, uh, with, uh, artillery. But so that was called like D minus five, D minus four, D minus three, D minus two, D minus one D day. So what the amphib recon Marines would do, they were trained to do a, a hydrographic survey, which is what's, what's the terrain of the beach from water's edge out hundred yards, 200 yards. And the way you do that is you have, um, uh, well, today there would be modern equipment, but then you would have a string with a weight with knots in the string. You would have swim trunks. Uh, you would have some kind of a board that you could make notes on or write on. And you would have your K-bar, your big knife. And that's it. And those guys would swim from the, they were usually on the troop carriers. They would swim ashore or, well, they wouldn't, they'd be out in the surf. And uh, they would take these surveys. They'd lower the weight at this spot and lower the weight at that spot and get a sense of what, what that beach was like just under the water, out, you know, right out into the surf. Um, I've been told that something like half of them never returned. Uh, of course, if it was a moonlit night, they could be seen out there easily in the, in the sand. And the Japanese were waiting with, you know, they had machine guns and bunkers and all that sort of thing. Uh, they were also shark-infested waters. Um, uh, I actually got to meet three of those guys, but I'll, I'll get back to that. 
So in D minus five, D minus four, D minus three, there was this speech survey uh, going on uh, 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 in all those islands before they were, we actually hit the beach. And that was that's kind of the forefather of uh, force reconnaissance. And it was called amphibious reconnaissance. And it stayed that way up until mid 50s. And uh, at that time, there were some new technologies like scuba. It was fairly new technology. Uh, parachutes, at least steerable parachutes, were a fairly new technology. Uh, jet planes, uh, helicopters. And so the Marine Corps, um, under the uh, leadership of uh, Bruce Myers, who was then, I think, a captain, uh, formed the first test unit to test means of getting uh, recon teams into enemy territory and then, of course, back out again. So it was something more than just a beach survey. That was still included. And the school, Amphibious Reconnaissance School down in Coronado is still there. And uh, we, you know, most of us went through that. So there was still that aspect of it. But then there were these other aspects like learning how to scuba dive, learning how to parachute, uh, submarine insertion, uh, PT boat insertion and extraction. Um, so those were all experimented with in this company called the First Test Unit. And uh, Bruce Myers wrote a book about it called uh, Fortune Favors the Brave. And it's quite detailed. Um, Bruce, is, Bruce would be 100 years old, I think, if he was still with us today. He lived into his 90s and uh, was kind of an icon of the Force Recon community. Um, any questions in that? or Actually, let me bring myself back on screen. That was excellent. I've actually got a few photos. Uh, one, uh, since it's the class photo, um, and I actually found you in this um this is pretty interesting guys i've never seen this photo um this if, i'll zoom in on the class so you can see this is fifth force recon oh, yeah. october of 67 camp pendleton mm -hmm. and if you go up to the very top the far There's left of the right photo where the is. yeah where was gunny solomon right there in uh, uh the big, the big guy right there. That's Gunny Solomon. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Good I know a lot a of these names. Face. A few will escape me, but uh, that's there me. There is Mr. Lou right there, looking yeah. off to the side. Mean. It looks like you've already got your your gold wings on. You got yeah. your rifle expert badge on. Uh, the whole nine. Well, what was your rank, or were you a corporal at the, already at this time? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I got meritoriously promoted three times in the, my first 10 and a half months in the Marine Corps, I never got promoted again <laughs> and uh, uh, never got in trouble. It wasn't that. I think Marine Corps froze promotions uh, in 68, uh, probably due to budgetary reasons, but yeah, that's McKinsey. Uh, well, oh. I could name a lot of those guys. And that, that is at some, at some point that was a unique uh, group. Uh, uh, so many of us young men that got trained by a lot of these, you know, our, staff when you think about it like okay we've got a co or an xo or a gunny sergeant that gunny sergeant's getting close to 20 years in the marine corps it's 1967 the first test unit started in 1957 just 10 years before that so these our our cadre were old corps and um you know they they'd all have nicknames uh some of them were legendary uh you know we had that's gunny uh left hand American Indian, uh, or, or there he's a staff sergeant, I think. Um, that's Akioka. That's uh, Sergeant Akioka, who is, I think, a Silver Star recipient, was with First Force in uh, the early 60s in Vietnam, mid-60s in Vietnam. I don't know. Those blood stripes on all these uh, gunnies and sergeants already yeah. right here. He's got yeah. a... Looks like that's he's got star, either a bronze or a Silver Star, too. Yes. Most of these guys have combat awards already on. yes korean a lot of them would have been korean or they'd already had one tour in vietnam by 1967 uh this there, i think was the fall of 67 also it wasn't like the beginning of, of uh fifth I, force it was uh, i think this was uh if i'm not mistaken i'll check it again but i think it was uh uh, may of 1967 is when this oh, okay. says the class photo was taken yeah. Um, yes, there is a question. Let me get this off real quick. Um, 
Jason may have just joined. Let's see. Um, sorry if I missed the explanation. Hey, Hi, Jason. Work. Hey, <laughs> uh, but what was Fifth Force doing while First and Third were in Vietnam? That's a good question. The Fifth Marine Division was uh, stood up as a training division. I don't think it was ever intended to be sent to Vietnam. Uh, so it, it and it stayed in existence. I don't know the exact details, but two years, I think. And there was 5th Recon Battalion. Uh, I'm sure there were uh, infantry units, uh, grunt units also in uh, the 5th Marine Division. So it kind of, uh, so the 1st Marine Division had occupied Pendleton. Well, they were by and large in Vietnam. So you had empty barracks and runways and, you know, mess halls and all that kind of stuff. So they repopulated it with in the big buildup. And uh, on, the East, on the East Coast, it was uh, second, but I, I can't really talk about that. I don't know that history. And this is a, uh, a fifth force training photo right here. I think it's from Mr. Larry Myers, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, is this what the uh, y'all would what it would look like when y'all were doing sub blockouts? Did y'all did you do any sub blockout trainings? Yes, yes. Uh, we had uh, I don't remember this with the, whatever the, this big container is on the deck. We uh, we didn't have that. We were on the U.S. Manhattan. Uh, and, uh, was, these were all World War II, uh, diesel converted submarines. I don't know quite what converted meant. Um, uh, technically, I guess they had radar and stuff that they may not have originally had. I'm not sure, but they called them World War II converted, but they were still the same sub basically. And, uh, yes, we locked out, uh, uh, off Catalina Island. The idea was, uh, maybe to step back a minute. <clears throat> so you have recon battalion. And the theoretical idea behind recon battalion is it's, it, it runs recon patrols, usually larger, and it runs them zero to seven miles out into enemy territory. Again, this is theory, the theory of it. And the reason for the range is because seven miles is the range of a 105 artillery field piece. Uh, they also run patrols and uh, 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 at the behest of the local infantry unit. So in theory, their patrol orders would come through the local uh, COs of the local infantry units. We, we want this. We want that. Go out here. How come we're getting so much fire from this area? That sort of thing. That would be the basis of it. Force reconnaissance in the first test unit, the idea was to recon, be able to recon seven to 300 miles into enemy territory. And uh, water submarines was uh, a way of getting 300 miles into enemy territory and getting out. So you could, a submarine could uh, supposedly be at periscope depth, which was roughly 60 feet. And it could get two to three miles, four miles within the coastline of enemy territory. You would lock out, uh, which means there's a small decompression chamber on these subs. I'm not sure what that is right there, but it wasn't, when I went out, we didn't have that. So, so that, I mean, and we didn't go out just once. Fifth Force, there were there were several times when there was a two week submarine insertion extraction, and I wasn't on every one of them. You'd go on one, and then that's what you did. Um, um, <clears throat> so you would lock, what's called lockout. So you would go into this tiny decompression chamber. So you're at sixty feet, roughly two atmospheres in scuba terms, and <clears throat> you're breathing compressed air in the submarine. And you go to this tiny thing. They usually had a, a, a either an instructor or a facilitator, and I mean two people inside this. That's you were very close. <laughs> that's all the room there was. So you'd go into this little chamber, and then the big door, like you see in all the submarine movies, they close this door that was between the uh, the tank and the rest of the sub, and they'd seal that off, and then they'd slowly open this other door, which led in the seawater until that. Uh, <clears throat> well, it would fill up to here because the tank's like this, right? And the hatch was down here. <clears throat> so it wouldn't take all the... Now, we're, you're not on tanks at this time. <clears throat> this is um, free swimming. Then you would lock out. <clears throat> and at that time, the air in your lungs is... There's three times more air in your lungs than there would be at uh, ground surface area. Then you're 60 feet deep. I don't know the exact, it may have been 54. I don't remember now the exact depth, 
but you got to go to the surface and then your team one by one would lock out. And then you'd meet up there and you would have gear, you know, that uh, when you package gear, your rifles, your radio, stuff like that. When you, generally speaking, when you wrap it in plastic and seal it, we used a tape, which is like a rigorous tape. Uh, there's enough air captured that it's buoyant. And uh, <clears throat> so you'd also push that stuff out and it would come bobbling up to the surface. When you, when you ascend it, and it's the most amazing, strange feeling in the world, <clears throat> you breathe out as fast as you can continuously because there's three times as much air in your lungs as there is on the surface and you're going to the surface. So the air in your lungs is constantly expanding. So <clears throat> here now we go. <sighs> and that's it, right? Your lungs are empty. On these buoyant ascents, you just kept exhaling. And it's a strange feeling. It's like, where's all this air coming from? It's that air in your lungs expanding because as you go up, the pressure uh, de decreases and the air expands. And if you don't do that, your lungs will li literally explode. Yeah. So that was locking out. <clears throat> then you'd gather your team. We were in uh, four man training teams. You'd gather and then <clears throat> you'd swim ashore. And uh, then you'd hide. The idea was you'd hide your gear. You may have a rubber boat. Uh, the rubber boats, when we went, let's see if I recognize that. Uh, kind of fuzzy. No, that's got the big tank on it too. So I don't think, I don't remember that on the Menhaden at all. Um, yeah, the idea was you would swim ashore. You might be in a rubber boat, in which case you would paddle ashore. Uh, and then you'd take your, your waterproofing off and you'd hide, deflate the rubber boat. If you had a rubber boat, you'd hide it in the bushes someplace along the shoreline. And then you do your land reconnaissance. And then you would come back at the end of the patrol, whether it was just overnight or several days, you would find that spot again along the beach where you'd hidden your gear, probably buried it in the sand. Uh, and this, this part would be at night for sure. And then you would, you know, repump up the rubber boat if you had one, or you'd re-waterproof your gear. And then you'd swim back out to the submarine, which would be not surface, but it would be the periscope sticking up. And, uh, Obviously, that's a, that's a needle in a haystack. There you go. There we are in our rubber boats. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, so that was, uh, that was submarine insertion and extraction. It's also, at the same time, when you take, you feel your air, that's Jim O'Flynn. He's my, uh, he was my first permanent team leader. Great guy. Um, when you dive uh, to 60 feet from the surface, you fill your lungs at the surface, but then as you're going down, that that air in your lungs compresses, and you get this feeling that you have to breathe in, and you're at like 55 feet, and 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 actually once you get there, you just don't go right into this tank. You may have to wait five seconds or 10 seconds. It seems like forever, and the urge to inhale, which would probably kill you, um, you probably drowned. You know, it wouldn't kill you instantly, but you, if you're at 60 feet of depth and you just took a deep breath of full of salt water in your lungs, you probably wouldn't live through that. Now they did have in training, they had guys right there with scuba tanks, you know, some of our cadre would be there and they could give you a, uh, you know, if you started to panic, they could tell and they would give you air uh, through the scuba. <clears throat> it was uh, all part of this, this same training. Uh, so that was uh, a lock in and lock out uh, submarine insertion and extraction. Um. We never did it in Vietnam. I think uh, the, the Mac V saw guys did it with the nasty boats up uh, off the beach. Would probably would, I'm, I, uh, that would be more like a PT boat. We did train in PT boat insertions and extraction. Kind of a different theory, except you're you're up there, behind uh, far behind enemy lines. And uh, I don't know if those enough about Mac V Sog to know if they actually landed or if the guy, the team would. The way uh, we did it with PT boats is the PT boat kind of buzzed the shore, if you will. And it wasn't that the enemy didn't know it was there, but we would, it would slow down to about 15 knots and we would have a rubber boat strapped to the sea side of it, not the land side of it. And the team would be in there. And then you would roll out of uh, uh, 
we practice this, of course, starting at a much lower speed, like maybe five knots. And you'd roll into the water out of the rubber boat. And the rubber boat, again, would be on the, I don't know if that's called leeward, uh, the opposite side of the beach, so that the enemy with binoculars couldn't necessarily see you uh, deploying a team. And again, it might be done at night. Um, then the pickup was picking you back up out of the water, the same thing, you'd swim ashore, you do your reconnaissance and uh, uh, you'd swim back out and the PT boat would pick you up. And the way they picked you up is you had the same rubber boat, eight man rubber boat lashed to the uh, ocean side of the PT boat. And there'd be a guy in the front with an inner tube, like a, just a car inner tube. And he usually had to be, you know, big shouldered guy. And you put your arm up like this and they would go by and you'd hook the, yeah. And you had to grab, you didn't, nobody ever I, that I knew of ever succeeded in just doing this. You had to lock and then you would roll and the guy in the rubber boat would pull and you'd practice that again at lower and lower speeds. And once you got the knack of it, it was pretty, you'd flip a guy right out of the water. It was, so we had a lot of fun. Now we never did that in Vietnam. I'm not implying that at all. Uh, we didn't do any submarine or um, uh, high-speed boat insertions and extractions uh, in third force reconnaissance. I'm not speaking for first force and certainly not for MACV SOG. Um, by the way, who to us were, they were the, the that's who we looked up to, MACV SOG. We were aware of them and, uh, um, you know, those guys were doing all sorts of stuff. The uh, we had a comment. John Briggs said, "Great job, Uncle Lou." Uh, oh yeah, earlier. Um, Hi, John. <laughs> the uh, the guys, uh, the 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 NAD side of SOG, which was the Marines and the Navy, they uh, they would most certainly they were snooping and pooping, not getting in as much, but they would definitely get the PT boats up and would either get in a rubber raft and raft in deploy do what they did snoop and poop snatch someone and then get out but uh it, it it was only few and far between because it was so so risky get, getting in and out of there so they did it but it, it wasn't all that much but they uh they did do it though the as you know i mean air uh not airborne boat inserts any way around it there's so much stuff that can go wrong uh, even if you get there, okay, you'll come back. The boat may have been popped on a limb or something like that. And, you know, it, it just turns into all kinds of stuff. Um, I did, by I, the way, I just interviewed, uh, and we can talk about this interview project too later on or whenever you want to, but um, Tom Campbell, uh, who was in MACV SOG as a Marine in 64 and 65. And um, his team did the uh, Nasty Boat. I guess a Norwegian boat yes, in Norway. Nasty, uh, but yep. Yep. Pretty much anything that I know about Mac V. Sog, uh, I got from uh, John Plaster, who did a terrific job in his book. And uh, I think I'll just take a moment to loud him. Uh, personally, these guys that write these books takes years and intense research. And, you know, there's grammar and there's story and there's, real lives involved and there are situations that may be less maybe delicate and you know there's all sorts of stuff that the work that goes in and and uh john's book sog is is uh, a classic it's terrific and uh the, along with this book guys and i'll it's already linked in the show notes but there's another one inside force recon uh before we end on speaking about the nad side uh they uh there, it, there might be uh, the, the, the initial raid for that's kicked off the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, the war may have actually kicked off and gotten hot, more hot, so to speak, because of a raid by a force recon NAD man. He's uh, the one that led the raid that shot up the uh, NVA patrol boat, fled, and they thought it was the Turner, and it, uh, it all kicked off from there. So, Strangely enough, uh, there was a force recon guy there to, to get the war started off. <laughs> yeah, we are always trouble. Um, you know, it's something, um, Gunny Hamlin, who's still alive, uh, is famous, uh, was on the cover of, I don't have it in front of me, in the 1960, maybe, of Life magazine, uh, lost a leg parachuting at high wire 
and burnt burnt his enough of his calf away that there was no saving the leg. So they amputated the leg. Uh, and of course, all that healing would take months in the hospital. And this was in the 60s. And uh, uh, he was one of my training cadre. Oh, you got his book, One Tough Marine? I was going to get this and uh, show Doc Norton yep. actually yep. wrote a great and probably the last uh, three chapters or at least uh, his, uh, his, his work with SOG. He gives a brief history on the Marine side of yep. SOG, but uh, – some of his teams, Team Romulus is one of the team he ran. Uh, he ran with uh, Nimbus as well, but Romulus was a heavy-duty team that he had with uh, 37 uh, former NVA, NVA and uh, South Vietnamese guys that they, they got into it. And again, guys, that's the other one that is just absolutely amazing by Ray Stubbe. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, Inside Force Recon. There's a book that was never published. And it's called, if I may, Aruga. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I kept looking for that every time he mentioned it in that book. And I, I, that's oh, I, what I was wondering. I you have do? I have it digitized. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And um, I'd be happy to send it to you. And that kind of was the basic book that became Inside Force Recon. And um, it's a wonderful a, book. Now, Tom Campbell, who I just mentioned, uh, his NAD. Mackey Sog team included Gunny Hamlin, mm. who had a wooden leg. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, for most people uh, staying inside Force Recon or the SEALs or Army Rangers, uh, you know, the physical, uh, it's really tough. I mean, you're like, you're like an Olympic athlete. I mean, the training is just harsh and, and it's constant. And there, you know, there are days off, you know, there have to be, you know, Sundays or whatever it is, <laughs> but the training is, is just extremely difficult and they're trying, they're training your, they're training your body, but they're also training your mind uh, not to quit. And when you're out there, you know, running a 20, you're in a 20 mile run in combat boots and a blister starting to form in your, and you know, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to pop and these things go through your mind. Like, Ah, my sergeant's an idiot. What am I doing here? This is stupid. You know, and it's like the, you know, the classical uh, with the analogy with the little, an angel and the devil, you yeah. know, <laughs> and uh, so you have to overcome that and you have to overcome it consistently. It's not just, oh, they did it once. Now it's all easy. I mean, let's go to the movies. No, <laughs> it's day in and day out, constant uh, pressure. And um, so when you, and also when you have ca cadre, we had a guy, um, Livingston, uh, one of our uh, Mustang. Um, I don't know if the Army uses that word. A Mustang or in the Marine Corps is somebody who was like a sergeant or a first sergeant, and they get a meritorious promotion to first lieutenant or second lieutenant. That's a Mustang. And it's a, it's a Marine Corps tradition and a very good one. Uh, I'm sure the Army has a similar thing. I don't know about the Navy. I forgot the term, but it's, it's not Mustang, but they've yeah. got a term for it as well. Yep. It's like you take the guy, the the guy in the factory floor and you put him in the mm -hmm. office. office. Yeah. You know, so, so you got a guy that actually knows what it's like to live down there. And now you're going to, you know, put him in a like chesty movie. puller. Was he a, a must hanger? Mm -hmm. I believe yes, it. Sir. he was pretty mm -hmm. much everything. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I know yeah, so before, before we start getting into the, the Vietnam, um, mm -hmm. were you were, were you, uh, were you dual cool or were you just airborne qualified uh, with fifth? Did no, you I went to scuba airborne? school. You yeah. did go to scuba yep. school yep. as well? Yeah, last in my class. <laughs> well, <laughs> passing is passing. So, hey, uh, where, where was uh, uh, where was scuba and where was airborne uh, for fifth force? Was it at Pendleton as well? Oh, I think all of us went to Benning. Oh, and, Benning. Okay. Uh, yeah, Fort Benning, Georgia. And, um, that I know of, all of us went to, there was then a scuba school uh, run by the Navy uh, at 32nd Street. It was actually a full, um, geez, I think it was eight weeks to be hard hat. And the first three weeks were scuba. And then the Marines, not, none of us Marines that I ever knew of went to hard hat. There was no need. That was like repair, you know, repair the hull or 
you know, of a ship or something where you can, with scuba, you can only be underwater a certain length of time. And uh, to put my glasses back on to see this, where are you getting all these pictures? These are great. Mr. David Thompson. Oh yeah. David Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, uh, this is the hard hat course right here. I guess they're doing a little bit of scuba work, but uh, this is, uh, it said scuba slash hard hat and it's got his diploma. I think he ended up getting his hard hat dive diploma, but I was just wondering if uh, this is at San Diego. So oh, I would, yeah, I would that looks curious. familiar. Boy. And let me tell you that water was filthy. Oh God. I've heard it was terrible, uh, terrible three stories. Foot, three foot of depth and it was utterly black. You could not see anything at three feet deep. And I'm not exaggerating. It was just so polluted with the years of, oil and diesel fuel from the ships and, and now uh, the the seals get so many staph infections because the runoff from tijuana straight into uh wherever the seals do their training i forgot the name of the oh i believe it because tijuana is, must be quite a bit bigger city than it was in the 60s oh uh, yeah it, it, a small it water is town basically in the 60s that I mean, they have to. Uh, heck, Andy Stump, shout out to Andy Stump for uh, Cleared Hot Podcast. He he was uh, not only went through as a seal uh, and and earning a, a spot on Dev Guru, but he went back as training cadre when he was injured, and uh, he 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 said at least every class was going to have at least two or three staff staff infections due to uh, d due to the water runoff. So yeah, we basically crazy. did not dive in the harbor. With exceptions, uh, we would go and get in a barge and go out to sea, or we would be in the pool. Uh, and um, one day, um, I don't know what they're called, but the, what the, the, uh, there's <clears throat> the little kind of power boats. They're not so little, but they're like 30, 40 foot power boats. <clears throat> and they're used to move people from the boat to shore or to another boat or whatever. I'm sure they have a name in the Navy. And they kind of had like a camper shell top. So they were all weather. And uh, in case, you know, the Admiral has to go, he doesn't want to get too wet. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, apparently, and, and, you know, they had these hoist and there, something happened in this shell that was the cover, kind of like a, uh, what do you call it in the back of a pickup, a camper shell or a shell fell off. Oh. And this is right where the destroyers are parked. And it was right outside the scuba school. And, um, uh, they wanted to retrieve it. And so they, we were right at the end of scuba school there. So we were pretty qualified and uh, they didn't want, they probably didn't want their good Navy divers to go down there because you're just in muck. I mean, literally it, when I'm, I'm saying three feet, it was black. You couldn't see your hand you know. And we were going down to like 20, 30 feet. They had a, a anchor cable a chain that we'd go down and we had a rope with knots on it. It'd be like a one inch barn rope, something like that. And we were in teams and anybody that had a scratch on their body, a break in their skin did not go in the water because of the reasons you just, you know, I don't know about Tijuana, but because of the, the water was so dirty. And uh, I think maybe our fourth, so you go down and you'd make a couple of circles. You're going down about 30 feet. So half an hour would be your maximum dive down, dive time down there anyway. But they just send us down, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes. And literally, as you went down, it was like um, <clears throat> going down into Kiefer. There wasn't like a hard bottom. It just got thicker. I mean, it's hard to make this stuff up, but that's the way it was. <clears throat> I remember pressing my fingertips on my mask, and I could not see my fingertips. Yeah. Pressing them. And there were, the water was all full of these little, I guess there's some sort of little microscopic uh, bug that eats the oil and it's uh, what's phosphorescent. It glowed. Mm -hmm. So this, this world would be full of all these tiny little specks moving around like this, but you couldn't see your fingertips pressed against your, and the, and the, the water wasn't really water. It was kind of mud. And um, <clears throat> of course we, I don't <clears throat> know that we could smell it, but it would be all the diesel fuel and oil and all that over the years. So we'd start, we circled this, Scotty Stout and I, I think we're the third team to go down and we got out maybe 20 feet. That was our, you know, the next number of knots outside the rope. And uh, uh, the team after us found it, it was on the other side of the ship. 
uh, because it was it was shaped. <clears throat> it didn't fall straight down. It was shaped. It was cup shaped, right? So as it went down, it probably went like this, and it went all the way underneath the destroyer and out the other side. Then when we came out, they had a gauntlet of Corman, and the first thing was you there was there were I think there were eight stations, two guys on each one, and the first one was well you took off your gear and they hosed you down. You know, you're just in your swim trucks and you were getting hosed down. No, in fact, no, we took off our swim truck. We were naked. Naked. This stuff could get inside your penis, you know. Oh, and, yeah. You know, and and then, you know, we go to the next station and they hosed us down with something else. And we go to the next station and we lay down on these cots, uh, cots like a surgical. And they they had these long Q-tips about like this and they stuck them down in this orange liquid and they stuck them up our nose. Oh. I mean, it was... You know, that's just being in that water for 10 minutes. Yeah. They, they, of course, they don't want you to get, you know, sick mm. or infected or anything like that. So, um, God almighty. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's length on, uh, I mean, there's stipulations on lo how long the, the, even the, the, the buds guys can be in the water in San Diego now. It, yeah, it's, I, uh, it. I think yeah. it's like 45 minutes tops. Yeah. So, I believe it. it but most of our diving was out to sea. We get in the bar, our sea diving, and we get in the barge and go out a couple of miles, and then the water's, you know, obviously a lot cleaner. Did you enjoy I, diving? Did you have any issues diving? Were you? Did <clears throat> well, I didn't. I went in the Marine Corps not really knowing how to swim, wow. and Iowa, there wasn't much swimming. I mean. Uh, uh, there were no natural lakes in Iowa, or maybe there was one. I don't remember. Minnesota's full of lakes. There's lakes all over Missouri, but Iowa and the Not places so that us kids would go to go to a swimming hole was usually an old quarry that had just filled mm. up with water and they'd have a lifeguard there and maybe, you know, a place you could get in and out because it's a hole dug in the ground with sheer side. So, you know, they had to have some, some security issues there. And um, the rivers, you know, it's dangerous swimming in a river. You get caught in a current, you're dead you're done. you know and uh so and i didn't float i was one of those people that you know I, 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 I my body fat was so low that i just literally did not float so the red cross swimming classes that they offered uh when i was a kid and you, you go to a certain spot get on a school bus go to a town that had a swimming pool you know and and all these little farm towns didn't have swimming pools and um I never passed. I couldn't pass that because I could never float. <laughs> so they said, well, you're doing it wrong. When I went to scuba school, they said, oh, a lot of people don't float. And uh, uh, so I had to, I literally had to pretty much learn how to swim. And uh, that's certainly why I came in last in my class. <laughs> it was swimming to me was staying alive in the water. Yeah. yeah. Dad, yeah. Dad told me that they, if you didn't know how to swim going in the Marine Corps, even by boot camp, you dang sure at least knew how to keep your head above water because drown proofing was no joke back in the old days. <laughs> um, I do want to say something more about fifth force. Absolutely. I think it's important to understand the special forces. Uh, you know, our gunny sergeant was Gunny Hamlin, who had a wooden leg. He parachuted with us. He ran with us. He swam with us. He had a wooden leg. And he was back from a tour in Vietnam in MACV SOG, or uh, what'd you call it? L -A -N -A -D? N -A -D. N-A-D? N-A-D, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, we had another guy, Livingston, I think was his name. He was a Mustanger. He had, I shot out in Korea. And we didn't even know until uh, one of the guys, Jim McKee, was in the NCOIC one night. And he goes into the uh, staff and officer's restroom. And there's Livingston with his eye out on the, on the sink. He's watching his face. So he took his eye out. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, that's the thing about it is the bar was set pretty high. You know, you think you got a blister in your boot and you're running right behind a guy with a wooden leg. That's a pretty high standard. And I think that's a very important thing to know about what it is to be in special forces. Um, whether it's SEALs or Rangers or, and I, I apologize, the current, the Army, uh, I don't know the name. You know, there's the Green Beret, certainly, and we had LERPs in Vietnam. But the, the current iteration of the Special Forces in the Army, I'm not sure what their what their name is right now. Other uh, than being, being A-teams or, you know, having CAG or, you know, the Special Mission Units, I think they're just 
you know, A teams and, and such, and they've got the little training detachments, but uh, I think they're regular old A teams now. Yeah, A teams. Um, yeah, I think this thing about setting the bar that high, because you, you look back on, you can look back philosophically on war in general, and you can say, oh, okay, you know, there's the bad guys, and you're going to be the centurion that protects the predators from the weak. You know, that's a traditional view of the warrior. But I think there's more to it than that. I think that there's an ethos, that there's something of value that you that you learn in your time in the military and as a warrior that is of value to the culture in general. There's, you know, some, uh, well, ethos is a really good word for it, you know, mm -hmm. that you can bring back. And uh, living outside yourself... I mean, you, it's almost like an out of body experience when you're in these, some of these, and you're in train and when you're out there in patrol too, where you, um, well, I can remember being on a run in fifth force and we just took off running and we stopped when there was only two guys left and we're running down the beach. We're running up hills, down hills. I think we covered about, they said about 20, 25 miles in utilities and boots with a backpack with a weight in it. So this is, you know, first of all, it attests to our level of training. It's like almost like running a marathon, except you're carrying, I think it was 30 pounds or something. And you're in boots. <laughs> you're running in boots. <clears throat> and you're not, you know, you're not running fast. But it's still the endurance is there. <clears throat> and uh, at the end of the race, there were just two of us left. And uh, one, I couldn't swim. I wasn't a good swimmer, but I could run. And uh uh, it was J.R. Smith, I think, Sergeant J.R. Smith. And I, it, it was, you know, I had a blister and then I knew it broke. And then I knew it was starting to bleed. And you could hear it every step. Mm. And it hurts. And there's only two of you left. And, it, you know, what are you trying to prove? And I remember both of us who were kind of looking at one another and he outranked me. So I wasn't going to say anything, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's just going to go. And, uh, but it's like an out of body experience at a certain point, there's a point on the other side of pain. There's a point on the other side of fear, you know, and in the training, you go to those, you, you, you do, you get to a certain point and it's almost like you're up here observing yourself and the pain then is there, but somehow it doesn't affect you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that guys that get shot charging a machine gun bucker and maybe get shot in a very painful place and they just keep going. You know, I'm sure that's a very similar type of thing. And I think that's an important quality uh, for any culture to have. And I think that's a, qual a quality that traditionally the warriors bring back into um, uh, um, the culture when the war is over. Uh, also absolutely. selflessness and we could talk about that too it you know um, we've uh <clears throat> we've we've got a few questions before we start getting into the uh when you ended up getting into third force and and into vietnam um jason was curious uh were y'all using uh m14s in training and qualifying with the 14 well in boot camp we did uh actually we used m1s uh oh. on drill uh, we went to the range and used M14s. Then in Force Recon, the M3A1, I think is what it's called, grease gun. That was our issued weapon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wow, he's got another good one. Um, how much of your training come f came from the WW2 jungle style combat? Were there any WW2 guys still in tr uh, still in the core when you were there? Uh, yes, there were. They were right at the end of their. Uh, careers uh say 65 66 that's 20 years after the end of world war ii and they would have gone in a few years before that uh, but there were still a few around um bruce myers went into the navy or, or the marine corps i mean right at 1944 i think um um where's that question again there's something else there and it just slipped my mind um Yes and no. Uh, I know Bruce was sent to, um, in the early 60s, he was actually sent uh, and uh, to what he called Indocene, um, which would be, I guess, Indochina. Um, 
and he spent some time with the British Royal Marines who were trying to protect plantations from guerrillas that would, you know, our, our training was called at, 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 uh, at that time, uh, anti-guerrilla counterinsurgency technique. And a lot of it didn't come from, that I'm aware of, didn't come from World War II. It came from uh, anti-guerrilla movements in the 50s in South America. And there's a book by a guy named Osanka, who I met and knew, I think he's passed on now, who would have been Ray Stubbe's age. Um, I have it here someplace. But that, that was sort of the tome of that, uh, you know, if you gotta, if you gotta fight the guerrillas who use small teams and, and um, hid in the jungles, um, it would attack and retreat. Uh, they were never trying to overpower you. The, the, you know, the job of the infantry is to make contact and fight it out right there. That's their job. That was not our job. You know, our job was swift, silent, and uh, sometimes deadly. And, you know, we can get into that, uh, uh, you know, obviously stingray or keyhole. But um, I think most of it came out of the 50s and the guerrilla, guerrilla movements against uh, regimes in, in South uh, Africa. That's my knowledge of it anyway. Um, this one will tie in later, but if we, I guess we can go ahead and cover a little bit of it because he, uh, you're, you're very close with this person and uh, I'd like to go ahead and get him some coverage. Um, Sal would like to know, does he know or did he ever work with Doc Lowell Bo Burwell? Uh, I know Bo very well. Um, I've done an interview with him, which is on Facebook. You can do uh, Facebook, YouTube. You can just put in Bo Burrell and you mm -hmm. will see the interview that Dave Moraney and I did, I think almost 13 years ago with Bo. Also with Nick Estevila and Larry Keene, who are all kind of legends. Uh, Bo was in the first group of third force that went to Vietnam. So third force did not go as a unit. Uh, two platoons went as what was called a detachment in uh, early 66. And Bo was one of those guys. Uh, Bo was career and uh, he's a legend in the uh, SEAL community. He's in the SEAL Hall of Fame. He's in the SEAL Museum. Uh, Bo would be in his early 80s now. And I think if you watch the interview that we did with him, um, you know, you'll get a whole, whole good sense of, uh, and everybody loves Bo, you know, <laughs> if you want to, you know, uh, I don't, it, it's hard to be more authentic than, oh, than Bo uh, is. You know? The straightest shooter and country is all get out and just yep. what a, what a, what a man. I mean, yep. two tours with force recon says, no, nah, I'm not quite done with it. And goes back to the seal teams after being UDT qualified before force recon and doing his run with two tours on the seal teams. It's just, by the way, a little bit of history there. The Navy had UDT underwater demolitions team, uh, which, you know, they they weren't recon as such. They might, go in with scuba and to, to recon a, a port or a bay for mines, but more, it, it, you know, they're going to plant explosives. They might try to sneak in and sink a ship or they might go swimming in to try to de-arm uh, uh, some explosive that's been, you know, is in the way. Uh, that was their job. And um, uh, for, uh, first force reconnaissance was actually formed in, uh, 1957 out of the first test unit they went ahead and said okay this works we're going to go with this and uh you know they were experimenting with all this stuff i mean they they literally were using jet small jet bombers with four guys four marines in the bomb bay and and flying over a drop zone and pulling <laughs> dropping them out yep. of the Bombay door. I mean, they experimented with all this stuff. They you know, create guys, they, uh, force recon actually, uh, created and started halo, uh, for, for the record. Uh, yeah. so I can't remember who the, it wasn't Hamblin. It was the other famous, uh, gunny or Sergeant major that did it. Uh, and I'm blank. I always blank on his name, but not Freitas. Was it Freitas? <sighs> I'll you know, look it up in a minute. My platoon no, commander. Trevathan, Tre Trevathan. I'll, I'll look it up while we're yeah, talking, yeah. but it's, it's, it's one interesting. Of the, it's a fairly small community. You know, at absolutely. any one time, there are something like 350 Force Recon Marines at any mm -hmm. one time. So, um, uh, 
everything's backward in my picture. So whatever I do, I do it the wrong way. Um, uh, I have to get Bo was on my to talk about all He was a that. Mustanger. I haven't heard that he's deceased. So he must, if he's alive, he must be 90. And he was, you know, he was kind of like a grouchy guy, I guess. And, uh, and he, mm, I can't do it, but he, he had this look on his face, which looked like he was mad all the time. And we found out later that he had done some set some record. And I don't know if it's on LinkedIn or where, it, where it's at, but he had set some record where he had jumped out of an airplane, haloed out without gear, without oxygen or clothing. And it set a world record at the time. And he got a permanent frostbite on his face, which, you know, killed some of the nerves. And that's why he had this look on his face. <laughs> we all thought he was just not the most pleasant guy. Wow. <laughs> and he wasn't. But the look, <laughs> the look, the look matched his uh, uh his face, you know. And again, that goes back to the, you know, where's the bar? You know, here's here's our <laughs> platoon commander who was well, not a young man at that time, and uh Gunny Hamlin and Livingston and um, you know, these guys were uh Ed Miller and uh, there's quite a list of these guys that were notorious. Um, and I'm sure the SEALs have them and and uh the army has them. Just found it right here. Uh, the most important of decorations and honors, arguably for, for first force recon's most important contribution was in the development of many special operation tactics still in use today with stunt parachutists and Marine Corps reserve Jacques Andre Estelle first force recon pioneered the free fall halo in 1958. We heard about it, but we never did it in uh, Fifth Force. And uh, I don't remember his name, but, you know, it may have been flying around at the time, but I don't know. In 1958, that is outstanding. Um, <clears throat> can you uh, lead us into how you, uh, A, get orders or, or, or uh, what's happening and how you learn about Vietnam and, and you getting to Vietnam? Well, uh, we did have, certainly by the fall of 67, we had guys coming into Fifth Force who had already done a tour in recon in Vietnam. And of course, we were very interested, you know. Uh, we were training in four-man teams at that time uh, in, in Fifth Force. Uh, myself, Tim Lamontane, who, by the way, was, would be a great guy to interview. He ran like 62 patrols, went to Ricondo school, came in first easy class in Ricondo school, was a team leader. Great guy. Um, and uh, um, just lost my train of thought there for a minute. So he, a guy named Ken Upholtz, who I looked up to as my big brother, um, and <laughs> which was questionable. Ken had, <laughs> Ken's deceased. Ken had been in the Army for uh, three years, was in the Army Airborne, I think the 82nd. And uh, uh, the story he told, which is totally believable if you knew Ken, uh, he met a gal, he got married, they had a big fight, and he probably got drunk. And to get even with her, he went down and enlisted in the Marine Corps. So <laughs> that was the end of that marriage. And uh, we had a few guys like that, that, uh, that had been in the Air Force for four years, had been in the Army. We had a couple of guys that had been previous tours in the Marine Corps and were like 24, 25, 26 years old that you know, we're in the company because they wanted to go to a war. They wanted to fight. Um, so anyway, there were four of us. The fourth guy was named Alan Files. We we're all 2533s, which was radio telegraph operator, meaning we knew how to operate the radio, set up the antennas and wire antennas. And we also knew Morse code, uh, which we occasionally used in Vietnam, um, in rare occasion, but occasionally we used it, not with the key. Um, and we got there February 23rd, 22nd of uh, 68. Um, it was quite a climate change from Pendleton, which was, you know, like Oceanside, uh, 70 degrees, you know, 60 degrees to 70 degrees year round, basically. And uh, it was hot in Vietnam. And so the first two or three days, we basically just laid in hooches and sweat. You know, you just lay there and you, you couldn't, you couldn't quench your thirst. You know, you just pour water through yourself, essentially, is what you do. You drink a canteen of water and you don't even pee. You just, just comes flying out of you. 
Um, and of course they knew that. So they just had us in this hooch where nobody else was, except uh, there were three of us. Lamentain was a couple of days behind us because he took a longer liberty or leave uh, before coming to Vietnam. Um, and um, we were getting shelled about twice a day regularly at Dong, uh, uh, Den, not Da Nang, Dong Ha. Uh, and that was just the routine. And, you know, all our hooches were full of little holes and uh, we had trenches all over the place uh, that, of course, this was all done before I got there. Uh, and then sandbags piled up on the sides of our hooches. And um, uh, I, maybe the third day I was there, there was this guy named Larry Lee. And Larry Lee, uh, he was, he had a little kind of loosey-goosey way about him. And I hadn't, you know, this was a force recon company and certainly in training, you didn't, if you're going to walk loosey goosey around, uh, uh, you know, one of your senior sergeants would call you in and you, you behave like a force recon Marine. You, you know, we don't walk around like that. You walk with your back straight and you walk straight ahead and that's how you behave. You know, everybody's watching you, you know, and that isn't true. We ran actually in training every place you went, like if you're going to go to chow, you ran to chow. And the only time you didn't run is like the first 15 minutes after you ate, you were allowed to walk. But otherwise, we we had this sense. And, it, it, you know, in the Marine Corps in 67, the only insignia that anybody wore, aside from rank, no other patches, uh, indications of anything. Every Marine was dressed exactly alike, except Force Recon, and we had the wings. In those days, we didn't have the little scuba bubble um and of course we polished them all up and if it was a sunny day you know you could you you could see you know a quarter mile away oh there's some force recon marines because you could see the wings glinting in the sun and you know we made a point of that you know trying to show off um so we were always very conscious that we were representing a certain group inside the marine corps and so lee was kind of i think he, you know he was like a kid maybe from um one of those rougher neighborhoods in New Jersey, you know, where you kind of, how you walked around uh, was important. And I was a farm kid. Of course, I didn't understand anything about that, but you know, so he'd kind of be like this and, and he was in charge of us next new guys, new in country. And um, uh, he would take us uh, later in the day to get our 782 gear. This is where you get water. Here's where the, uh, you know, that the first day or two in that heat, you didn't even want to eat. I mean, you just didn't. You just not you weren't hungry. If you were a smoker, you didn't you didn't you didn't didn't matter how, how much you smoked. You didn't even want a cigarette. I mean, it's just you know that much of a shock to your body. So that was his job. His job was to, you know, take us around and show us the ropes and stuff. Uh we would uh, toward the end of the second day, we would sit on the little steps in the front of the hooch. The hooch just had a, you know, it's a Southeast Asian hut or something they call them. It had a little crawl space underneath it. And uh, um, we'd sit on the little front steps and the guys in the company wouldn't even look at us. It was like we weren't there. And frankly, it was weird. It was strange. Uh, what we didn't know because we weren't talking to anybody in the company. The company had just lost eight guys in the last couple of weeks. And that's traumatic. You know? And uh, uh, that was the Graves Patrol. Uh, Doc Bridges was killed in a helicopter crash. Um, the Graves Patrol, there were four dead. I can't remember. You know, I didn't know these guys because I just gotten there. Right. Um, uh, at any rate, the company was just kind of in a state of trauma, I guess you would call it. And uh, so that's why they were walking by us. You know, they just, they didn't want to, they didn't want to have personal contact with somebody because guys they had had personal contact with had slept aside and told stories and drank beer with were gone, dead. Oh, you know, at any rate, about the third day, I think it was, it's all on record someplace if I bothered to look it up. We had, uh, like I say, we get incoming twice a day, and it was mostly harassment. It wasn't pinpoint. The base was such that the NBA could get up in a tree line or something close enough to get off a few rounds, you know, maybe, you know, mortar rounds or occasionally a uh, recoilless rifle. They had a, I think it was called a 105. It was a Russian recoilless rifle. 
and then they just run because you know we they'd be spotted right away so they wouldn't stay and um it was so it was it was harassment and it would hit things you know and uh so at any rate um we were, it was afternoon we were getting hit there's a whole kind of story behind this but lee was we had a tower which was like four telephone pole heights and a little you know up a ladder and then the little booth up there so you could see out and look around the tree lines and you see a little puff of smoke that's where they're shooting from and uh so lee uh had to run across an open space um i don't know i don't remember now 10 or 20 yards I mean, it was more than 10 yards maybe it was 30 and he took a direct hit from a 105 and you knew it pretty much right. I mean, I was only three days in country and I knew I grew up on a farm. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I knew what burnt flesh smelled like, you know, and those, those rounds would hit, there's that smell of cordite. And when they hit the ground, this hard ground would be blown up in the air and it would just rain bits and pieces, of dirt, and little rocks and stuff. You're down there in the trenches like this. And you'd have that smell of cordite and um, gunpowder. And uh, when that smell happened, of course, Lee didn't yell out, oh, my God, I've been hit or anything. I mean, he took a direct hit with, I don't know, 70 pounds of TNT. Uh, there was that smell of burnt flesh, um, you know, when the dirt came running down on us. And then we immediately heard these two Hueys, Huey gunships, that were flying over us right toward where this enemy fire was coming from. So we knew they're not going to shoot anymore at us. And um, came out of that, came out of the trench. I, I happened to be fairly close and, you know, this is my first death that I saw in Vietnam and he's splattered. I mean, bits of him, just little tiny bits of him are splattered over the sandbags and, um, there, there was really nothing. One of the corpsmen was over there, but I mean, there was, you know, there was part of a, a leg and a boot. There was part of a shoulder. I mean, it, you know, it was uh, uh, not pretty. And um, uh, you don't forget something like that. You know, it's uh, uh, Larry Lee. He'd written a poem that was in uh, Stars and Stripes. And uh, um I have to go back and try to refine that someplace again. Um, so that was, you know, that was okay. You're here. And I think I was lucky in a way uh, because for me, and I, I know a lot of other guys talking to him, a lot of the way that I found courage was in not thinking I was going to live through it. It's just a question of time, you know, and uh, that certainly wasn't statistically true. I think probably at least half of us got shot at one point or another or, or uh, shrapnel, but uh, most of the guys lived through it. You know, oh, I don't know exactly what our death rate was. I've, I mean, to repeat it, I've seen it on paper. Uh, they're from third recon battalion, which includes third force. Uh, and again, that's a, uh, I don't know if Andy went over this or not, but technically logistically, the force recon company is one of the companies inside recon battalion. We got our orders from a different place, which caused friction at times in like that. But uh, the guys over at uh, third recon battalion, um, uh, Floyd Nagler, who just passed away, uh, George Neville, uh, these guys have done tremendous work uh, putting together these uh, associations and, um, uh, you know, the reunions we go to and scholarship funds we have and that sort of thing. Um, Tom Boland, uh, Floyd, uh, oh, fiddle from First Recon Battalion. I interviewed him right now at the moment. I can't say his last name. Um, also, first name Floyd. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought there for a minute. Um, oh, yes. They said that the, the percentage of the highest percentage in the Marine Corps of uh, WIAs and KIAs was third recon battalion. So I don't know how they garnered that, but they're the kind of guys that, 
wouldn't make it up, you know? So, uh, and from what I saw, that's, it's certainly reasonable. You know, I know some of these infantry companies, the walking dead, you know, your dad, you know, uh, just took beatings all the time. Uh, it, uh, but it was, you know, it was a norm for us. Um, not to the extent I don't think of the Mac V Sog, you know, guys. Uh, I think they took a, a bigger beating um, than we did. But uh, uh, it still isn't fun, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. No, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, real I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, with uh well here's a question before i ask mine um were were the was the stoner around at that time andy mentioned and rabbi mentioned that they tested the stoner i think in 68 or maybe 67 what was it around in your time period boy i recognize the name but i can't even tell you what it was the was navy the navy seal uh machine gun uh the force recon tested it first and evidently they wanted the seals to have it. So they took them from y'all and throw them down South, the seal teams. Yeah, it was, um, I believe that. Um, and I recognize the name, but I don't know. I don't, I have no, uh, uh, we had a few Swiss. It depended on who your CO was. And probably that depended on, on uh, who his CO was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, there were times when we were taking with one CO, we were taking out weapons of our choice. Not that we had a wide choice. We didn't have what, uh, what Mac V Sog had, you know, mm -hmm. like whole army. Oh yeah. We had yeah. more of a limited choice. Uh, Swedish K. I think that's what they were called. Uh, French mm -hmm. carried one. Uh, when I first got there, yeah, we, you know, I took out a sawed off M14 on one patrol. Uh, the biggest problem with the M14 is two problems, the weight, um, but they're also so long and you're going through heavy brush a lot. And uh, it's much easier to take a shorter weapon through heavy brush than it is a long weapon. But um, they would, they had real knockdown power. But it seems like y'all spent the four 50% higher, just the weight of the ammunition and the gun itself. Yeah. I mean, y'all rocking the, the 14s and then the 16s and when y'all could get, uh, car 15s from sf guys or air force guys but it seems like y'all and i can see why uh y'all love the m14 and they, they it, it was about to the point where they had to force them out of y'all's hands because y'all loved them so much yeah no it's a great weapon as was i think the m1 uh not that i ever used it in combat but and I, the 14 i took out i never fired at that patrol which uh and also i had the radio so uh, a lot of times, you know, you're not ha having a receiver and a rifle that, that wasn't much of a fit. And technically, we carry a pistol. That was part of the uh, as a radio. What did officer. you carry at 1911, uh, 45 or? Uh, I did sometimes. Uh, I carried. I had a 357 revolver. <laughs> you know, you just you're young, you know, and you yeah. look like a cowboy. It looked like a cowboy. Oh, pistol. Can't it was, out there. Yeah, and it. Uh, the problem with that is that it, you know, they have that, I don't know what it's called, but the handle has a curve to it. And the kickback was so much, you'd fire that thing once and it would just roll up in your hand, no matter how strong you thought you were. Whereas the, you know, the square shape of like the 1911 A1, it, you know, it, it wouldn't roll in your hand, even though it had about the same kickback. Maybe, maybe that 357 had higher kickback. I took it out a few times and it was just, I never used it, you know, and where'd you go buy ammo? I only had a limited amount of ammo, uh, but True I thought, I, you know, I grew up in cowboy movies and <laughs> I thought that was the thing to do. I guess I bought it from John uh, Godwin. I gave him, I don't know, 10 bucks or 20 bucks for it. I don't remember. And, uh, and then I couldn't even sell it when I left. And I think I gave it, I'm pretty sure I gave it to Artie Hubner <laughs> and Artie accidentally shot himself with it. Oh God. Yeah. He got, he got a serious, what they call a spiral fracture. And, uh, he was goofing around with the gun and, um, we had that, you know, we had a corpsman killed uh, in the rear. Two, two guys were, you know, messing around. around. And it happened. It happened yeah. certainly more than would ever be written down any place statistically. Cause if you think if you're the CO or the gunny sergeant, you're not you want to write that. home to mom and dad. Well, Johnny was accidentally killed by uh, one of his buddies. 
Um, and that that happened in Sog at the club. You know, guys would come in and, you know, uh, even Sog guys that had been there a while were messing around with the Swedish K and, you know, it's got that open bolt and he happened to bump it or drop it and it yeah. put about 14 in there, 14 in the wall before, uh, you know, they could do anything about it. Guy got hit in the ass cheek and one in the leg and thank God nothing more serious than that. But, yeah. you know. Um, yep. Yeah, We've, I think uh, probably in Vietnam, accidental deaths could have been uh, 30% or 40 or friendly fire, I should say. Mm -hmm. There was artillery. Uh, you know, Little Murph, who I train with. Uh, I do want to say something about that group that I train with in Fifth Force. I, as far as I know, there's no way without a huge amount of effort. And even with the effort, it may not be possible to track the records. Most of the guys I train with, I'm going to say 100 guys. You saw that picture, right? It's easy to say there were 100 guys. There. 85, 85 total, okay. not counting the officers and everybody not pictured. Okay. Well, the majority of those guys ended up in first force <laughs> and uh, Bobby Buddha, David mm. Thompson, Jim McKee, who Andy talks about in his book, you know, um, Sicilese, Dorset, Joe Lyons, who was my, we, we had bunks next to one another. We used to go on. R&R uh, &R with Joe all the time. I bought his MGA when he went, got orders to Vietnam. He was KIA in first force and a silver star winner. Um, I'm st still in touch with his daughter. He was one of the few guys that had children. Had a, he had a daughter. Um, and Kim Piam, who's uh, a good friend. Uh, of course, now she's, you know, not a young woman anymore. Um, yeah, Lee Phillips, uh, Tiny Innebrad. Um, on and on. I mean, so many of these guys and Joe and uh, uh, is that put my glasses back on? That's Bob Buddha. I don't know who the guy. Oh with yeah, him that's is. Buddha. No, I don't know who that is on the right side, but that's definitely Bobby Buddha. He and I He's were in the same training platoon, uh, in so I knew Bobby very well. And, and uh, it sounds like he was quite the quite the Marine as well. Oh, he was. Yeah, yeah, he was, and uh, so was Jim McKee. And um, um, David Thompson, David Thompson, oh, yeah. I think, took over Killer Kane. I think the team name may have changed, but it went uh, to Swift Scout after that because yeah, it had gotten so yeah. much heat. And Larry Quigley uh, was in that. Trying piece. to get Larry on. He's sick at the moment. Mr. Larry, if you're watching, yeah, I hope hi, you're Larry. feeling better. Um, well, he was we're trying you know, to he get was him in, in that incident when, when way when Ted happened. Oh, God. Um, they, they, went through first force and uh, probably first recon battalion. I'm not sure, but I know they went through first force and said, get your gear. We got a, we got a big incident and some six buys came up and uh, a bunch of force recon Marines got on the back of six buys and went, you know, um, up to uh, way poorly equipped for that job because that's not the job we normally did. So they took Bush gear. Larry ended up shot laying in the, oh, yeah. laying in the open because they couldn't get to him. And um, he's lucky he didn't bleed out. The the South Vietnamese sat there and watched them being attacked. I've, he sent me a lot of photos from that, yeah. and he finally got out of harm's way, and he called in artillery and just blew. I mean, he's got a picture of the block before, and then right after artillery yeah. comes in, and they just leveled that. He, they, all of them are lucky that they did not. Uh, more people weren't seriously injured uh, on um, that. I think incident. Doc Hilgendorf may have been in on that, who was our corpsman in, in fifth force. Doc also, as far as we know, is the only corpsman to uh, bring home the iron mic from jump school and come in first in scuba school. Wow. And I, I, I was lucky enough to interview him. He was also the only guy in fifth force that was also from Iowa. So <laughs> um, uh, Al Mervin, he was, uh, he was on that six by with, you know, Quigley and, and uh, they went up there. I think Lee Phillips was Lee's deceased now. Uh, I guess what I wanted to say about that group is that if records could be from just like reunions and, you know, stories, I mean, it's like it, almost everybody had a purple heart and a bronze star at least. Yeah. So I'm very proud of that group, you know, and of course the leadership, because we, we would have been nobody without that leadership, you know, that took us through that. So looks like we're getting, I'm fine, but we, it looks like we're, we, we've, uh, we've, uh, we will go about uh, 30 minutes because there's a good question. And then I wanted you to cover a little bit about uh, Hill 950, but this oh is going to take a, take a second because uh, 
I still have some issues and some, some other people are always wanting to know the difference and you'd be a perfect, uh, perfect person to help us out with this. What are the difference between force and battalion recon? Well, we went over that earlier. Uh, basically in theory, it, 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 there's theory and then there's a reality of Vietnam, right? It's a, Vietnam was a certain kind of a battlefield. We essentially ran the same patrols in recon force and recon battalion with exceptions. Uh, for me in 68, we had switched to four man patrols and that's all we ran. And they're called keyhole. Uh, in short, force recon is long further out. They're tra we're trained to go further out into enemy territory than recon battalion is. That's in theory. Um, in Vietnam, we, we patrolled the same areas and the guys who were further out were Mac V Sog. You know, they were, they were out there. And, um, um, lost my train of thought there again. A bug, a big, a, a great book. Yes, that's a good and explanation. I'm, I'm about to start and, on Stingray and Keyhole. Yeah, Stingray is when you, you're, you're, it's like a kill mission. Maybe you're taking a prisoner. Maybe you're going to go out and you're going to go out to destroy something. So you're going to go bigger teams. You're going to carry, you may have an M60. You may have two radios. You may this and you may that, you know. Uh, keyhole is you're strictly spying and with the four man teams which is all as it turned out that's all I ever ran I, and I'm not even sure how many patrols I ran somewhere maybe 20 more than 16 there's no re our records are lost for that time third force we, nobody can find our records uh, and so I, I can't go back and, and look and I didn't keep a notebook while I was there so it was all in my memory um but every patrol I ran was a four man patrol and that was it. God. You think differently because if you get one guy shot, whether it's, he's a KIA or a WIA or shot in the foot and you know, it doesn't matter. Somebody has got to carry him or take care of him. Now you got two guys with guns, right? That was that that's kind of the downfall of it. Five is probably a better number. I think the Lerps ran five. And by in, in comparison, I would say we were we and the Lerps were the most alike, you know, between the Army and the in the um, Marine Corps. Uh, and we went to a lot of our guys went to Recondo School in the Trang. Lamentain did, and and uh, Schilla and uh, Neary, and I don't even know. It started in the fall of '68, as far as I know. And I was getting toward the end of my tour, so they didn't send me down there. But uh, that was a rugged school, you know. It's serious business down there. Um, so in 68, and this hasn't been written about, uh, there's no book about it. Uh, it's different. You're out there with four guys. You've got to be more cautious, period. We actually had, if anything, a little bit less KIAs and WIAs. Um, we were in contact all the time. Uh, and, and and to put a caveat, not to interrupt you, but you're you, you need to explain you're you're running four man patrols near Contien near the DMZ. Yep. I mean, you're you're right there where the all of the NVA are coming through, except for in Laos. This is the busiest action yep. road. Oh yeah, we were. You go out on patrol, and they were all over the place. The footprint of a four man. If, if you have to, this is the way. I believe that it literally works. You got four guys, you got eight. Eight is more than twice as many as four. It's probably three times as many. The likelihood of when you got eight guys of a mistake is much higher. It's crazy. Yeah. And uh, with four guys, your heads are on swivels all the time. Uh, you're hyper aware of the fact uh, you may be in an artillery shadow. Now, how am I going to move? I'm in an artillery shadow, meaning you're on the side of a hill or we didn't have artillery coverage hundred percent up there, maybe 50%. And the shadows were generally, you're right in the other side of a mountain and, you know, artillery is, well, of course, naval gunfire is flat and that's even worse because you can't shoot at all on the other side of a hill with the one, you know, 155s and the 175 shot a lot flatter, but um, yeah, you, there are a lot of spots out there where you didn't have artillery coverage. And then, well, where, what's the range? So if you're seven miles away from a 105, that's the end of its range. How much are its barrels worn? And this, we, we would get that in our briefing. Okay, did, you're going to be out here. 
You're going to be seven miles away from this 105 battery that's going to fire for you. The barrels are worn, which means they're inaccurate. And, and that's miles. the difference between 25 and 30 feet. And that's yep. very dangerous when yep. four Marines are calling in artillery guys. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So yet you, you, you needed to know all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, so it was a different way of thinking. But you're still out there and you're still reconning and we still had NBA, you know, get, we'd get in the brush at the side of a trail and it was common that they'd be uh, walking past you. Um, probably what we didn't do as much as they did with bigger teams. If you saw two guys diddy bopping down a trail, you probably just let them go. Mm -hmm. You probably didn't engage because they could be point for a, a, a team. Company. Uh, yeah, a company. And they're all over out there anyway. The Ho Chi Minh Trail is like this net, you know, it's all these little trails. And when you think about it, you're going, first of all, you're going through terrain that lends itself. I mean, you go to a mountain river, it just doesn't go straight. It's going like this, right? The easiest path, the easiest path. So you're doing the same thing on these trails. You're following the easiest path. Plus, if you, it, it's easier to see from the sky, from a recon bird flying over. If you're, there's a straight line there, you see the pattern. Whereas if it's random, you don't see it. So it made a lot of sense. So you had all these little intersecting trails and they're all over the place. And, you know, now if you saw two guys and one of them was carrying a big something in his rucksack that looked like it wasn't hand grenades, <laughs> meaning it was probably payroll or some kind of documentation, then you might, you might shoot those guys, you know, to get the stuff, you know, um, you know, and we, you know, we had a, and I'm not going to mention names here, but we had a team where they did just that. They saw two NBA, the women dressed just like the men when there were women out there, mm -hmm. they shot them, uh, went down to the bodies, the woman, one of them was a woman. They had no idea, you know, that one of the guys had just killed a woman, uh, or just, I mean, she was part of her, you know, it's been described to me that, but Part of her head was gone, but she was still alive. She was looking with her other eye that was still there. And then she, you know, passed away. Uh, and they found out going through her papers, she was a doctor. And the guy that shot her, uh, they say was never the same after that. And uh, I've, I know I I've, yeah. I've heard of that story. And the guy, uh, not to interrupt you again, I, that's rude. But that's the, to give the viewers a little more instance, because I'll get comments and all of this and just for the record guys if y'all don't like watching uh vets share their stories and their histories you you know you don't have to watch it you you don't have to comment on the instagram page saying uh nasty stuff which i get out of here but the, you know you, you don't have to watch but the uh the, the for what i've been told from speaking to men that she was very uh not elusive, but she she was trying to blend in as best she could, being with men, and it looked to, to like to the guy that, that he that she was a he, and it, you know she had he had important documents, and he took the shot only to come when he took the coolie hat off, long hair fell out, and you know so he was not there to shoot a woman, you know, on the trail. So to clear that up for viewers, not to take the steam out of your story there. Yeah, taking a prisoner was a big deal. Now, with four-man teams, you didn't try. Uh, I, he probably wasn't trying to kill her. He was probably trying to wound her. Mm -hmm. And, you know. Stuff she, happens she anymore. Her. Yeah, we, we wouldn't have. It kind of wasn't our job to go kill the enemy, which was one of the good things I liked about recon, to be honest with you. You know, it, it, it was not our job to kill people. And uh, I'm, I'm, all, I would, I'm sure that in this case, he was not trying to kill her. He was trying to wound, wound her. And, you know, it didn't, it didn't work. Cause the intel you could get from a doctor that it either just left fixing up the boys that had been battered or mm -hmm. on their way to fix up boys that had been battered is, you know, a, a gold mine in intelligence. So I, yeah. I, I feel pretty sure on that as well. Um, since you're talking about people diddy bopping down the trail, what are the range of weapons you're seeing on the, on the NBA also in the VC? Are you seeing the AKs, the SKSs? Are you seeing RPDs? What, what, what all are you seeing at this point in time? Um, 
kind of, you know, the patrols I ran, we did AKs, you know, we're getting mm. shot at by AKs and you know that, you know, that sound, <laughs> man, there's no doubt. Uh, I don't remember being shot at by any other weapons. I'm sure there were. And if you talk to some of the other guys, they may say, oh yeah, that, you know, that guy had a Swedish K or whatever it was. Um, hand grenades, you know. Oh yeah. And uh, the RPGs coming at y'all a lot. Not in recon. Uh, no. uh, now into helicopters. Yes. Mm. Not um, never in the situations I was in three hot extracts, like the kind you don't think you're going to live through it kind of thing. And an RPG was never involved, but talking to other guys, interviewing other guys, it was not uncommon for an RPG to be shot at the helicopter or occasionally at the team. But that was, you know, you're already compromised in that yeah. position, meaning they know where you are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to say, they knew we were there. Oh, yeah. And things changed. Uh, it's 67, uh, Third Force, running up uh, patrols all around Quezon up there. They usually had to blow an LZ. It's a jungle. And that's the Anamite Mountains. And there's no place to land a helicopter. You know, when you get land in the middle of a river, well, you, you, you can't do that. The team jumps off and you don't even know how deep the water is, you know. And you know, it, it, was, it was intense. Jungles are intense. And so they would blow. Uh, NLZ, they'd have a phantom come in and blow off a mountaintop, you know, and then the next day they come out. Well, then the NVA catches on. Well, it's probably a recon team. Let's send because they're staying low, you know, where the triple canopy is. When you get up on the mountaintops, uh, they'd be mountaintops like, well, I was on 950. That's meters. That's 3000 feet. So rugged, pretty rugged terrain, steep. A lot of really steep terrain up there, but three to four, I think 1372, whatever that is, times three, times 38 inches, uh, 4,000, 4,500 feet. That was the kind of the range. Hill 400 would be 1,200 feet. Just take it times three, whatever they, mm -hmm. whatever it was called. Um, well, after Quezon, there had been so many B-52 arc lights up there that there were bomb craters all over the place. And if you see the pictures... It's stunning. I mean, it's, they defoliate an area, you know, okay. and uh, um, so we didn't, you know, I, I never went on patrol where we had to blow it up at LZ, <laughs> you know. Um, and then, of course, the, the, you know, in 67, toward the end of the year, the NBA figured this out. And they've also figured out when the team wants to get out, they got to blow an LZ. And they're probably going to try to get back to that one. And they might be there waiting for it. Oh, yeah. And then by 68, they'd start to develop uh, anti-recon teams, teams who would just go out there and they'd wait around these LZs. And I got a lot of stories about that from the, uh, I, I, I was on a patrol. It was seven minutes. Maybe we were on the ground. As soon as the helicopters were out of sight, they opened up on us and you know, uh, they're waiting for us. See, that's uh see, we're getting to the two hour now mark yeah. and we've got a lot of viewers and we've still got a, some interesting stuff to cover now. Would you like to break this into a two-parter or how would you like to, to handle this? Because there are a few questions and we've still got you covering some of your interesting aspects that you went through. Um, yeah, I know some good stories that I can tell in a short amount of time. So I, 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 I wouldn't mind answering a few questions now. But then, okay. yeah, I think, I think it's important to because I'm doing interviews of these. Uh, you know, Absolutely you know, tell the stories of some of these patrols, which are unbelievable. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, I'll get this uh, last question. And if you'd like to, you can, you can share some stories with us before we close out. Um, SOG left in 72. Uh, SOG did, they, they came under a different name. Uh, when was Force Recon out of Vietnam? Officially? Uh, early 1970. Yeah. First, that uh, third force was dissolved in, uh, I think the end of February, the colors were taken down again that month, February of 70, as well as February of 68, uh, third force took eight casualties that month. And I think the TO, um, tactical operational, something or other, how many people you're supposed to have in these different jobs with uh, for force recon company, which is a, a bigger company because of scuba, you get scuba, you got the paraloft, you got, you know, all this specialty stuff. So there's, um, it, it would be bigger than a grunt company. Mm -hmm. um, we maybe had a hundred guys when I was there, maybe, 
and maybe we maybe had 10 te- in the fall of 68 we maybe had 10 teams and those are four man teams we maybe had 40 guys running the bush the marine corps was just depleted and the same thing happened in uh, um, uh, 1970 they built up again in the, uh, in the summer and fall of 69 uh, but then the marine corps just the marine corps didn't have the budget Oh, yeah, that I mean, that, that's one thing that really makes me mad, uh, especially with what y'all were doing. And, uh, you know, SOG had a, basically a blank check and they're doing all they're doing. And meanwhile, y'all are running recon and, you know, WW2 Korea hammy downs and, and having the 14, <laughs> having to steal, you know, M16s or, or the, the first M16s jammed up. You know, it, I, I could go on and on. But, yeah, yeah. Um, for a story, uh, we may have to do a special on you just talking about Hill 950, or you can uh, throw some in. But I know a very interesting one, uh, a story would be, um, was Mr. Barry Babin, I know there's one where, was he on a POW raid, uh, a, a four-man patrol, uh, or a 10-man patrol uh, with Third Force into Laos, or... No, Barry would not have been. That would be Jim Capers. Um, I think maybe Bo was on that patrol uh, where they, yeah, they got a, um, intel and they did find the camp. It was deserted and then they got badly ambushed getting back out again. But they, they were into la- layoffs uh, on, for that patrol. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Barry's team was Tim LaMontagne, Steve Falstrom, Richard yes, Wiley. That was Coral Bush. That was... Um, uh, surrounded again, by a thousand uh and they are in we we uh put in uh to headquarters marine corps um 2019 for uh three silver stars and a bronze star for that patrol and uh, 47 pages of documentation um and we're still waiting to hear back uh the, that division of the marine corps of course it's underfunded <laughs> And uh, they, you know, with COVID and then their, their building flooded uh, last winter in a, one of these big rainstorms. And they fortunately did not lose all the records, but they had to, you know, for three months they were operating out of, I don't know, dog houses. I'm not sure what they were doing, but good people trying hard to get their job done. And so we're still waiting to hear back from that. But, uh, and that's another story, uh, essentially, um, they were inserted, a four-man team was inserted right near Hill uh, 861. They were inserted on top of the 324th NVA division, which was tunneled in. And uh, the extract the next afternoon, the sister helicopter, so 46, with, with that era, we were 46s, were flying us in and out, Marine Corps 46s, medium helicopter. Um, one one they'd always fly in pairs and the reason they did that if one shot down got shot down or had mechanical problems they're flying over enemy territory all the time um the other helicopter could land and get to at least get the crew out right that, so they were all almost always in pairs I, I never saw them fly singular anyway the sister bird the one that's staying up at two three thousand feet while one bird is coming in to get the team out under heavy fire is that berwick that's Berwick. And uh, he and I were in fifth force together. Um, the pilot during the hot extraction uh, yelled out something like it was dusk. So you could see tracers. And he yelled out like something like, my God, there must be a thousand muzzle flashes. Probably wasn't, but there could have realistically been four or 500 NBA, you know, shooting. And, uh, some of the guys in that team had whole bullet holes in their clothing. Uh, the helicopter had a whole bunch of holes in it and somehow nobody got shot. Uh, almost unbelievable. Uh, so they're, yeah, hot extracts. Well, you know, I've been on them and, uh, uh, it was fairly common. You know, I'd say at least a third of our patrols were shot out. Um, maybe a little more than that. I'm not sure. And there would be the occasional, like you might end up exchanging a little fire, like for whatever reason, maybe those two NBA diddy bopping along. Um, uh, 
maybe you did open fire on them or maybe they saw you and opened fire on you, which happened, you know, accidentally, of course, we didn't want them to see us, but it might happen. But if it was something like that, we, uh, we break engagement and, and run and disengage. And it's hard to understand, but if you're in a jungle, if you're a hundred yards away from somebody, you might as well be halfway around the world. I mean, literally it's, you know, so that happened a lot. You know, we'd have some minor contact and, and uh, you wouldn't, that wouldn't end the patrol. So, uh, emergency extract usually was when there was, you. well, you had a wounded because they come and get you out um, or uh, uh, you were in heavy, you know, obviously it was a much superior force. Your time out there by yourself would be 15 to 20 minutes under those circumstances with four guys. That's all the firepower you had. And you're carrying lighter, you know, you're not carrying as many magazines or as many hand grenades because your, you, you, your ability to run was, had to always be there. And if you loaded yourself down really heavily, like an eight man patrol would, they couldn't move as fast. They couldn't break contact and, and get away. Whereas with the four man team, that was a tactic that we had and it was often used. Mr. Uh, Gosh, I'm blanking. I know it's a Joe. Is it Joe Lyons? Uh, mm -hmm. He were you with him in fifth or uh, yes. in third force? No, um, fifth force. No, our bunks were. Uh, uh, Joe and I were good friends. Yeah. Now that's Jim O'Flynn. Oh, that's Jim O'Flynn. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He 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 loved wearing his shirt open like that. His stomach was all scars, and he oh. had been in the infantry. Jim had been in the Marine Corps for four years, had gotten out. Uh, I think he was dealing cards in Reno, as I remember. And oh. uh, that beret he has, he part of his, uh, he gave that to me when he left Vietnam and I gave it to Nicely. I wish I would have kept it. Nothing against Nicely, but, you know, I love Jim. And uh, he had been hit in the, one of the enemy rounds, the AK rounds hit his magazines and the oh. bullets inside his magazines exploded. So he was out about, I think six weeks he had a colostomy but mostly the scars were superficial they they had not penetrated you know his per, peripeneal whatever it is um so he was proud of the fact he looked like he'd been cut apart and sewn back together by a really bad doctor <laughs> good lord <laughs> and, what a uh, tough he, young yeah, man he, yeah he came um into force recon and uh <laughs> when i came down from 950 i was assigned to his team and uh all those guys are dead except Alexis Perry, who's a good friend. And there's a very interesting guy. He won't talk much, but his dad was an international war correspondent, famous war correspondent, and ran with Hemingway in that crowd. And, and uh, it's a whole, you know, his dad was a Russian Jew. And when the Bolsheviks uh, hit uh, St. Petersburg and the, they fled and the 12 year old kid got separated from his family, which was not unusual in that, I guess that train station in St. Petersburg. And he grew up with gangs of kids hiding from the, uh, hiding from the Bolsheviks and stealing vegetables and sleeping in barn lofts and uh, wrote a number of books and uh, had a, you know, a brief marriage and love affair uh, with Fritchie's mom. We called him Fritchie. He didn't particularly like it, but he spoke French and uh, he's actually not French. He's Belgium and, you know, and uh, after Vietnam, Frenchy ran like 60 patrols. He was there for two full tours and he would, he knows all about Alex Lee and that group and Doc Norton, Doc Norton's first patrol, Frenchy was on it. Oh, damn. Uh, he was, you know, just new in company in the summer of 69. Um, Frenchy then went on to run an international skydiving school because with his passport, he could go to Cuba or go to Russia or go to all these places that there might be, you know, controversy with an American being able to get in and out of those countries. Um, and he had I don't know, thousands of jumps, thousands of jumps. You know, I don't know how many, you know, 10,000, something like that. You know. Good Lord. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Interesting guys. You know, to say the least. Um, let's see here. Uh, there's a reunion photo of you. I've got a photo, but I, if, I'll save it for when we talk about 950. Uh, I think that's a reunion photo. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's Terry Addis to the uh, on the left in my picture. Uh, Jim Sandoz with the mustache, Dwayne Neary, the short guy. That's me, 
and then Al Beerline. Uh, Beerline and Sandoz, uh, who were both alive, they were on the patrol with, uh, I think it was Michelle and Gunny Walsh, where they were up on a ridge line, which meant not a stick. It wasn't triple canopy. When you got up there, it's, it's usually tree, it's always tree covered, but it's uh, not a stick. And Sam, uh, Jim Sandoz, uh, he happened to see an enemy patrol, which was probably an anti-recon patrol based on its size. They were usually 12 to 15 guys. And you almost never saw them up in the ridgeline. So they were up there for a reason. Mm. And uh, they didn't have time to react. So there was a bush. You can't really hide a team behind a tree. <laughs> you know, but there was, I don't know, brush. And that they all backed into it and were sitting down with the rifles off safety and this thinking this team would pass. And the team decided to have lunch and literally put all the rifles, laid them up against the tree over there. I had no idea the team was right there in the brush. Uh, one of the guys sat on Sandos's foot, sat on his foot, and started eating his lunch because he thought it was a, you know, root of a tree. And uh, another guy leaned up against Michelle's knee you know, again, thinking it was just a part of a tree. And uh, the leader of the group, after all these men had started eating, and he was obviously well-trained, and he had walked around and looked all around, okay, oh, it's safe. Now I'm going to have my lunch. And he did as you might do if you're going to sit down, he facing into the brush, and then he would pivot, you know, pivot around, a normal thing for a human being to do. And when he, there was Beerline's face right there, and he knew, you know, and it's that, you freeze for an instant and beer line opened fire. And these guys were not, they, uh, they didn't have the rifles. They didn't know what was going on. And they, you know, the team cut them up pretty bad and then said, we got to get out of here because, you know, there are going to be others coming. And we got uh, a DD now. Yep. Well, you know, again, I have this on interview. Uh, they started going one way and they realized they had to call for an extraction and I can't remember now the details of it, but for whatever reason, they had to go back by this spot. I think they were running one way and they saw another NBA team coming up to respond oh. to the gunfire because the sound of the 16s, they knew it wasn't, you know. And um, so they had to turn back and run right past this scene and uh, um, and get extracted uh, from that. But um, I think uh, Beerline got a bronze star from that Uh, uh I, I mean, that's one of the, I mean, I've heard some crazy SOG stories about people being tapped, but to be sat on eating lunch, that, uh, that, that, that's, yeah. that takes the cake for the closest and the scariest thing I've ever heard in my life. That is that those guys had to have some nerves of steel to wait that long to, uh, open up on them. I mean, well, I think that's the point of the hard, harsh physical training, that thing of, you know, you got, you're there and some guy just sat in your foot. And, uh, you know, when you took your rifle off safety and when you didn't was probably the most important tactic you had or one of the top 10, no doubt, because if they're too close, they can hear it. And it's a dead giveaway. There's no sound like it. An AK comes off safety has a different sound than an M16 coming off safety, you know. And so, uh, you know, and then there's there's danger. Now, when you stop and you're not moving, there's less danger of you accidentally pulling the trigger when you're going through brush with your rifle a branch could pull the trigger if you're off safety so you know being off safety was not you know uh you didn't want to do it unless you had to but when you had to you had to anticipate and do it you know not when they were within 20 yards of you because they would hear it and there was no way it didn't matter how much you tried you could didn't matter how you held your tongue you know ah, move that little thing off safety Click. Click. <laughs> yeah. Not a problem the infantry ever had, right? Because they always knew where the infantry was. You know? But it was a problem we had. Uh, you, you wish they would have put a piece of Teflon in there or something. <laughs> Anything to muffle that, that, that just would just echo throughout the jungle. Yeah. Uh, well, we, uh, we're almost at two hours and 10 minutes. Would you, uh, considering we we i mean we could still have some stuff going would you like to just make this a part two to where we can uh do a, a, a all marine episode and then cover a little bit of the last part of your history in vietnam 
Uh, yes, for part and, two. and I'd like to talk at least a little bit about uh, the project that I'm doing, which is very similar to what you're doing, and that is I'm interviewing guys, uh, not live. Uh, and uh, I think I have, we have 60 interviews. I have a partner uh, who is also in third force. Um, and um, uh, we're going to start publishing them literally any minute uh, on uh, a YouTube channel called Recon Dash Diary. And we're going to include, uh, you know, if it's a Mar uh, if it's a Mac V Sog Army guy, great. You know, we're not. I don't. I remember reading. I'm not going to mention branches of the service, <laughs> but you get these books, and it's, you know, you read the introduction, and uh, that special forces group walks on water, yeah, and it's the oh, best yeah. thing, you know, since sliced bread, and they're all wonderful and magnificent. And they never mention the other branches of the service, which is the real problem, frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you start reading the book and they do some stupid thing. No wonder they got ambushed. Duh. You don't do that. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. I, I, I see it. And I'm a voracious reader and I see it right off the bat. I'm like, oh, I can tell where this is going right off the bat. Oh, a 60 <laughs> second, a 30 second take on this. My uh, nephew, John, who was up on here a while ago, he was 10 years in the uh, Navy and he was a pilot. Oh, right? wow. And uh, he's, uh, uh, you know, likes the military history and stuff like that. And maybe 15, 20 years ago, he uh, he's, he sent me this book by this guy named Marchinko. Oh, and, Dick. And uh, so I read through this book and uh, you know, not too far. And I'm going, ah, that's not how it works. <laughs> so I, I wrote to Johnny and I told him, you know, that's, that's, I, you know, uh, and see, how would you know? And it was a bit, it was an important moment for me. And I, I thank John, you know, profusely for this. He was in the military, but there's no way of just like, I don't, there's no way you, I know what it's like to be up in an airplane that starts falling apart. And Johnny has been. I, there's no way I can understand what that is. And so in trying to recap and tell the stories like you're doing and I'm doing with the interviews and Marini, my partner Marini is doing, uh, you just have to be aware of that, that you can't really tell a war story unless you've been there. And you could say the same thing about farming unless you've been there or being a teacher in an inner city school or growing up in the inner city, you know, where gunfire was a part of your life. There are a lot of things you could say that about. And, uh, part of the value in telling all these stories is to get at least you get some comprehension of how the other side lives no. And I'd love to, considering you're about to start releasing those uh, after we finish your part two of just you. I'd love to have you and your partner on uh, to promote that because just the two that I've seen with Bo, that guys I've linked in the show notes, uh, I, I mean, y'all do outstanding work and I, I'd love to promote it and get it out there as much as I can because it's it's amazing, just absolutely amazing. Yeah, and we love you because you're not going to die in the next few years. <laughs> We're all dying off. Oh, well, hey, now don't say that. Us. You got, you got me knocking on wood and crossing my fingers and toes here. Don't yeah. say that now. Uh, we, uh, you know, I, 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 you definitely need to get some, some, uh, some, some publicity for for the stuff you're about to release because it's some of the. I was hooked. I can't tell you how many times I've watched the the Bo interview. And it's I still pick up new stuff uh, from watching it. So I, I would absolutely love to uh, have you guys on to, to get y'all a little promotion for that. But um, I think it would there... be helpful for the Iraqi and Afghanistan veterans too to uh, the stories of warriors. You know, if you're I'm, a warrior, I'm, it's the, I, you know. I'm really. Uh, I'm concentrating on you guys while I can because you guys, I hate to say it, are getting older. Uh, uh, but I am gonna gonna. I've got some stuff in the work to interview some uh, G Watt and even some Grenada and stuff like that veterans uh, and and uh, Mogadishu veterans. But uh, I, I'm really trying to get as many Vietnam veterans as I can before I really start focusing on them. But I am gonna be focusing on the 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 current state so to speak but um, um can i say something in closing absolutely absolutely um, i just want to thank uh i got i wrote i was writing a list here last night uh carl Melantis, oh yes doc norton 
Ron Winter, uh, who was in HMM 161. Uh, the helicopter stories are fabulous. Andy Finlayson, mm-hmm. uh, Tim O'Brien, who wrote The Things We Carried. Uh, Mike Archer uh, was Quezon veteran. Ken Rogers, who made the do- – they- these were infantry guys uh, who wrote the- – made the documentary uh, Bravo about uh, the siege of Quezon. Uh, Larry Vetter, who was in 3rd Recon Battalion and wrote the book Never Without Heroes. Uh, and uh, I'm going to forget some people here. Uh, John Plaster for his uh, book, The Sog. And I'm sure I'm, I'm leaving out many, but, you know, I really deeply appreciate the work and effort these guys put in. It took years, hundreds and hundreds of hours of their time to do this. And, uh, um, you know, I think, you know, the more people we can thank, the better. Absolutely. And I'm, uh, I'm, I try and thank any author I have on or anybody that's, uh, mentions any any of the guests I have on I, I promote uh but I'm gonna end up doing one day uh each split up the marine and and sog and I'm gonna honor each author and speak a little bit about their contributions because like you said they definitely need to be recognized considering y'all aren't y'all don't have most of y'all's records sogs have been were classified until the 90s and even some have been destroyed so uh, absolutely. The work y'all have done is, uh, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing, uh, if y'all hadn't done what y'all have done. So I, I, I'm following y'all's footsteps as, as hard as I can to, to, to follow on and keep it alive. But that, uh, if I uh, maybe, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm clear the rest of October when other than when stuff pops up and, um, we'll stay in touch and uh, we'll get part two planned here for the next week or so to where we can have you on to uh, finish up and share some more of your stories. Well, Semper Fi. Semper Fi. And guys, y'all stay tuned. We'll have it uh, up and ready next week sometime and uh, I'll keep you updated. But uh, we want to thank you, Mr. Lou, for spending two hours with us today. It means a lot and we're already looking forward to part two. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. You have a good day and Semper Fi. See.